Welcome to Venture and Capital. This conference is about bringing together and empowering innovation, ambition, and capital. This is a conference for high net worth, professional, and family office investors. Hi, my name is Steve Torsa. I'm the Founder and Managing Director of Wholesale Investor. During the conference, we're gonna be providing you with the closest experience to a live event with keynote speakers, panel sessions, live Q and A's, break out with some of the top VCs from not just from Australia, but also around the globe, 60 plus investment opportunities from some of the highest growth sectors at the moment going through some incredible transitions, creating exponential opportunities for investors, and also a special live stream breakout. Now, you will meet as part of the conference the fund manager rated by Morningstar as one of Australia's top fund managers. You're going to be meeting a startup who achieved incredible 52k of monthly recurring revenue in their second month after launching. You meet a fund manager who achieved 318% return in their most recent year. You'll get to meet the renewable energy tech startup which recently secured a $15 million contract you'll get to meet the startup which expanded to 50 plus countries in only 24 months in an incredible achievement. How about meeting a profitable online marketplace which is expected to grow to 10 million of revenue in FY22? Yes, I said the word profitable. And an international fund manager who delivered nearly 16x returns on their investment in the last 12 months. And lastly, the venture capitalist who's using deep learning and has invested millions in data and modeling to help drive predictable venture returns. The Venture and Capital Conference, as I mentioned, it is focused around empowering innovation, ambition, and capital. For today's keynote speeches, you'll get to hear from Jordan Green, who's probably one of the most well-renowned angels on the planet and is highly regarded. And as part of his session, he's going to be talking about Angel 101 and how he's looking for opportunities, what he's looking at, and also how they typically like to structure deals. We will get to meet Yasser El Ansari, who's the Chief Executive at the Australian Investment Council, which is the preeminent body in Australia for venture and capital and private equity. Now, as part of the conference, as I said, we've done everything to make this as close to an interactive and engaging experience as possible, and we do that via our official conference app via Brella. Now, inside the Brella app, once you've got yourself set up, you'll be able to meet, network, and match with relevant companies that suit the opportunities which you're actually looking for. The platform is also where the breakout sessions are going to be held for investors during the actual conference. So we've got a lot of incredible stuff lined up for today and we've also simplified it in such a way where the morning sessions are going to be focused around the presentations, the keynotes, the panel sessions, etc. In the afternoon is your opportunity to meet with whoever you want to meet, attend our breakout sessions and really interact with live Q&A with some of the speakers that are participating in the session. So Every part from the content aspect to the engagement aspect is covered inside the Brella platform. I welcome you to Venture and Capital 2021. Enjoy the experience. Hi, I'm here today to share with you a bit about angel investing what it is, who does it, now you can get involved. I started my angel investing 25 years ago while I was building a software startup in Silicon Valley. Back then, we didn't know it was called angel investing. It was just sort of the thing that you did. I was a young man building a high-tech company in the throbbing, beating heart of the global technology community. Startups and entrepreneurship were nowhere near as mainstream as they are today. I came back from that experience, I came home to Australia, and I initiated the organized angel investor community. 15 years ago, I founded the Melbourne Angels, and today I still represent Australia in the international angel community. I chair the Asian Business Angel Forum, I'm a trustee for the Angel Resource Institute in the United States, I'm involved in a number of other international angel organizations, and I have trained thousands of people in angel investing across three continents. An angel investor, to me, is a person who invests his or her own money and time in an unlisted growth company 
as a personal decision with the objective of realizing a capital return in the foreseeable future. Unlike passive private investors, angel investors are distinguished by their commitment to invest both financial capital and intellectual capital, money and time. Proactive contribution of intellectual capital is key to mitigating the risk and promoting success. If we can't contribute intellectual capital, then we won't invest our financial capital. Angel investing is an exciting and rewarding way of investing in startups. It is a personal proactive investment in alignment with the founders. Imagine being a foundation investor in a technology company that delivers a cure for diabetes. That's a real Australian company right now. Imagine as an angel shareholder, your advice helps the company succeed with a universal payment system that has all the convenience and security of credit cards, none of the fees. That's an actual angel-backed Australian venture. Imagine you invested in a startup just as it started to scale its revenue. And then six years later, the company sells to a global corporate, giving you 10 times your money back. Angel investing is being a proactive participant in that entrepreneurial adventure a whole bunch of startups. But why? Why do we need startups? Why invest in startups? Why take all of this risk? Everyone wants the world to be a better place, and everyone is looking to the change enabled by radical innovation to lead us out of our troubles and into that better world. Startups are designed to succeed at radical innovation. To offset the risk and the high failure rate of startups, you will need to build a portfolio of at least 10 concurrent investments. A portfolio is important because startup investments are illiquid. That is, you are usually locked in for the entire journey until the company is sold. You can reasonably expect that at least half of everything you invest in as an angel investor will completely fail to return any cash to you at all. This is all about the high risk and the high reward. Angel investors align themselves with the future success of founders because the rewards to founder shares and the rewards to angel shares are very likely to be very closely aligned by the time an exit comes around. So if you are a founder seeking powerful aligned investment, please reach out to Melbourne Angels now. We'd love to talk to you. If you're an investor, what should you expect to get as your rewards from angel investing? Financial returns, of course, that's what investing is all about. However, all the most successful angel investors that I know all around the world are more focused on other metrics of success. The personal satisfaction of contributing to the growth and improvement of our society. Or paying it forward by creating new, well-paid jobs within our own communities. And frankly, there's a lot of fun to be had as an angel investor. The reward of working in the camaraderie of a diverse group of good people with shared values doing good things together. The simple joy of using what we know and we've learned throughout our careers to help others create new value. The intellectual challenge of seeing the world differently through the eyes of a visionary founder. The satisfaction of disrupting the status quo to change the world for the better and simple appreciation that you will receive from the founders for your valued involvement in their ventures. Still, we have to think about the money. My first angel investment was last century, as I told you, and it delivered a 100 times return. That is, about four years after I invested, I sold my shares, and I got back 100 times more money than I invested. My first angel investment this century returned 34 times after 10 years. And in the noughties, I co-founded one of the best performing VC funds in Australia, and that returned eight times in five years. Every company in which you invest must be exposed to the risk of success. Our job as angels investors is not to find all the reasons why a venture might fail. Any 12-year-old kid can say it will fail and most likely be right. After all, in excess of 75% of all new ventures fail, and that's even higher in high growth startups. No, the real art is to see the opportunity for success and a credible path to exit. 
anyone with a passion, time, a modest financial capacity can be an angel investor. Angel investing is for women and men, young and old. Some will have deep expertise, others extensive experience. Some will have a fresh perspective and others a youthful positivity. Many, like when I started, are still working full time. Others may have sold their own businesses or retired from their primary careers. Most angels are people who have built or are building their own success, which gives them the confidence to guide others. But you don't have to wait. Some of the most valuable insights for the best investment decisions come from those angels who are embedded in the relevant markets or customer experiences. You should develop your own angel investment thesis. Your thesis summarizes the key parameters and constraints you choose to define your approach to angel investing, the elements that you believe will deliver the best chances of success for you. While every choice is yours to make, there are some factors that connect choices together, some research and data that can inform your choices, and some perspectives that will shape the expectations you have as a result of your choices. So your base investment thesis may consider these issues. What is your purpose? How do you intend to go about your angel investing? And where will you focus that effort? What's your capacity to invest, both in total and how you'll do that on a deal-by-deal -deal basis or across your portfolio? How will you take ownership in the companies in which you invest or will you choose to be a debt provider instead? And is it important that you're involved with these companies for, during and after your investment? Would you like to lead the deals or would you rather someone else took that rather difficult role? How much time do you have to give to this endeavor? And who will you do it with? Will you invest in each company just once or will you invest in these companies time and time again? And when it does come time to reap the benefits, how are you going to influence the exit? What do you expect of the exit? Where it'll be, how big it'll be? These are all just the considerations that you will have to make. But none of these are immutable limits. They provide a guide for good investment decision, discipline. When you join an angel group, like Melbourne Angels, at least some of these parameters will be set by the group focus and the group process. At Melbourne Angels, most of our investments are in pre-revenue startups, and we are sector agnostic. However, we have learned over time, there are some investments our members simply don't want to consider. For example, gambling. The trick to looking at sectors in early stage investing is not to follow trends. Trends are backward looking phenomena. As early stage startup investors, we must in anticipate the market, not follow it. Startups typically take at least two to three years to be ready to meet the market. In fact, research shows that market timing is the number one reason for both the success and failure of startups. Your thesis will help you to know what you want. Then you'll need a process, a way to source deals in what is a very noisy marketplace. Quickly filter and evaluate those opportunities to be a good fit for you and your thesis. Know what you consider reasonable terms for investment and have a way to stay engaged. Rule of thumb, you need to touch 50 to 100 initial opportunities to find one that is the right fit for you. To contemplate the angel investment life cycle, the way I've just outlined, at the very beginning, you have to find those deals. Now, for any individual deal, from the time you first contact the founder, the time that you make a commitment and put money in the bank as an investment, it's probably going to take you somewhere between a couple of months and six months. It could take longer. It probably shouldn't. However, during this phase is when you have the most influence over the shape of the opportunity, the shape of the investment terms, and frankly, the chances for you to get the returns that you're investing for. But once you've finished that and you are invested, now you come to the longest period of time, holding your investment as a shareholder, and finding ways to help the company grow, to support the company and probably to reinvest in the company over time. 
Eventually, you finally get to the reward, the chance to reap the benefits that you've been looking for by exiting the company. Usually that'll be because the whole company has been sold, but there are many other models that you might consider. What you will not have to understand is that an exit is not just a point in time, of course it does culminate in a transaction, but even an exit is a process that will take time. You may have some skills, networks, contacts, knowledge that can help the company create and navigate its exit path, or you may be passive at that stage of the investment. So let's work through that from the beginning again, just a little bit. When you're looking for deal flow, it's a combination of hunting and fishing. When you're hunting, you go looking for what you want. When you're fishing, you dangle a lure and wait for the fish to take the bait. So when you're hunting, you're using your investment thesis to go and target the things that really work for you. When you're fishing, you're waiting for those opportunities to come forward. And where will they come from? Well, when you join an angel group in particular, you get the advantage of the brand. The group has a website, it's active, it's known, it's got many members. It's a working within the startup ecosystem. Of course, you can find opportunities depending on what you're interested in from universities, from accelerators, find them from other investors who choose to have you as a co-investor. And of course, there are many advisory firms, accountants, lawyers, wealth managers, family officers, all sorts of opportunities to network and find the deal flow that you're going to find. However you do it, it will take a substantial amount of it. Now, once you start meeting these companies, of course, you're going to have to give them an answer about whether or not you want to move forward in the talking to them about the opportunity to invest. The single most common answer you're going to give is no. The next answer you might be giving is, well, no, not right now for these reasons, and maybe yes when things change. So please come back to me. Ultimately, the one answer that the founders and you are really both looking for is the one that says, I'm really curious about what you're telling me. Let's talk about it some more. Now, Triaging your opportunities quickly against some of your really core elements of your investment thesis is going to be absolutely necessary. What, which elements? Well, they could be the quantum of investment, the valuation, the sector, the geography, or even the team among all of the others you have to choose from. It really depends on what you consider the real deal breakers. Once opportunities get through your triage, you'll probably want to get a pitch as a first quick way to understand more about the opportunity. I teach founders and investors about the three C's of pitching. First is confidence. A founder has to be confident in what they do. And in giving a pitch, they have to engender in you confidence in their opportunity, in their solution, and probably most importantly, in them, in the founder and the team. And one of the best ways that they can do all of that is to be very confident in what they're saying, confident in their knowledge, confident in their vision, and to do all of that with the second C, which is clarity. Clarity is that delicate balance between going into all of the details and being brief enough to give us a quick rundown. So the challenge of clarity is that the founder in a pitch has to go from the beginning to end of their story, making sure we learn all the really important things that there are to know along the way, even if we don't get all of the detail attached to all of many people, this is the hardest job to do, but it is also one of the most critical skills to develop if they're going to be successful in sales, they're going to recruit the right staff people, the right channel partners, and in fact, additional investors. So if they can act with confidence and through clarity engender confidence in us, then ultimately the final goal of the pitch is that curiosity that I talked about before. We want to get to the end of the pitch going, wow, that was a really good pitch. I have a great understanding of what it is you're doing, or at least I think I do. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. You're not usually eager to ask a bunch of questions about a pitch you didn't understand at all, or that doesn't get you excited about the opportunity. Once you start asking those questions, you're basically moving into the due diligence phase. Now, I would say that every due diligence you will ever do as an angel investor has already started. Why do I say that? Because due diligence is a process. 
of validating assumptions and verifying claims. And doing all of that relies upon your own knowledge, experience, and expertise. Most angel investors do not use third parties to conduct due diligence. And those rare occasions when you do need some expert input, that is when your own networks will be most valuable. To do due diligence, you'll inspect the business plan, interview the team, review the company documents, accounts, and if they exist, speak to customers and to competitors. But for startups, there is always a paucity of information, a lack of really hard evidence and enormous uncertainty. Now, if the information is scarce, the analysis indefinite, the conclusion subjective, and the quantum of investment relatively modest, why do any due diligence at all? Because research shows that due diligence has the single biggest impact on your returns of all pre-investment activities. Too little time on due diligence is strongly associated with the worst outcomes, while the strongest returns only happen after a substantial due diligence. Working in an angel group is one of the best ways to access the time and breadth of resources required to do good due diligence. It is worth remembering that angel investors are not investing alone. So good quality due diligence is a key enabler to co-invest. And similarly, due diligence is an excellent tool for constantly validating your own investment thesis and thus further enhancing your reputation as a professional and astute investor. Once you've finished due diligence, you'll have the information you need to shape the investment terms. Now, the key terms of investment will certainly relate to how much equity you are buying, how involved you expect to be in advising and guiding the company, the current stage of the company, and the future capital intensity. Many angel investors prefer capital efficient ventures, ones that can quickly reach sustainable, profitable, and rapidly growing revenues. These tend to be businesses based on significant innovation and disruption. Less appealing are the ventures that require tens or hundreds of millions of venture capital, as is common with consumer and retail businesses, which must buy their customers until they reach maximum scale. Capital intensity has a significant impact on probability of success. Time to exit and frequently limits the returns available to angels. Investing in a venture that is pre-revenue and likely to need millions more of investment capital requires that you take very simple and vanilla investment terms, unless you are certain of being the source of most of that future capital. If you take aggressive and highly privileged terms of investment, they become a barrier to future investors, and they reflect badly on both your skill as an investor and on the founder's commercial acumen. Founders are always eager to move quickly. Beware, speed is not always your friend when you are trying to validate the opportunity and working to establish a relationship that is likely to last at least five years, even longer if the company is a huge success. Remember the old saying, act in haste, repent at leisure. On the other hand, taking too long can be just as bad. Remember we discussed the need to build a portfolio of at least 10 concurrent investments. If you can, you would be wise to build a bigger portfolio. But remember that quality is always more important than quantity. That is why you have to find your investment thesis. In your investment thesis, you will have considered your model for post-investment engagement. And again, the research shows that just as with due diligence before investing, Doing a good job of engagement after investing has the biggest impact on your returns. But can we do all of this in Australia? Can we actually be successful doing this in Australia? Absolutely. A great example from the Melbourne Angels portfolio is Rome to Rio. This company was founded by two very clever young men committed to the idea that they could build in Melbourne a world-leading tech company that would dominate the global market. They did exactly that, defining and dominating the global market segment for multimodal travel plan. And they did it with just two early rounds of modest angel investment. 
and a strong focus on over-delivering on their value proposition to their customers. The result? After six years, the company was sold to a German online travel conglomerate. A very satisfying return to the investors and, of course, an even more satisfying return to the founders. But it gets better than that. Rome to Rio continues to operate in Melbourne under its own brand, growing its core business, employing more people, paying local taxes, and enhancing the reputation of Australia. Melbourne Angels member who was a director and had served as chairman of Rome to Rio was encouraged by the acquirer to remain on the board, which she has done. This is what we want to see. Companies that do something entirely new, open new markets, create new jobs, and drive significant export revenues, all from an Australian base with the support of angel investment and advice. To build your portfolio can be expensive in dollars, time, and the opportunity cost against all the other things you want to do in life. An angel group offers you three things that lie at the core of realizing an effective, successful, and enjoyable portfolio of startup investments. First, when you join a group, you get access to the deeper financial resources of the collective, and thus you are able to invest a little bit less per deal and therefore in more deals than you would be likely to do on your own. This diversification by volume is the first primary risk mitigation strategy of any investment portfolio. Most people are astute enough to know they want to invest in the things they understand. No matter how experienced we are, nor, nor how much we know, each of us is only likely to be deeply confident in a relatively narrow range of business opportunities. On our own, we're challenged to find all of those very best opportunities within that narrow scope. When you join an angel group, you benefit from the depth, breadth, and diversity of the expertise, experience, and networks of all the other members. Thus, you're able to invest in a greater range of businesses than you are likely to have done on your own. This diversification by scope is the second primary risk mitigation strategy of any investment portfolio. In theory, you could do both those things on your own. That is, you could make more money and you could learn new stuff. In practice, it may not be so easy. But the third thing that you get with an angel group, you can get no other way. The third benefit of a group is time. The whole process of sourcing and evaluating opportunities, remember that 100 to 1 ratio I talked about? Negotiating investments, coaching founders, supporting exits. It all demands a wide range of skills and a lot of time. When you join an angel group, you get to learn and refine your skills through practice and training with experienced colleagues. When you join a member-led angel group like Melbourne Angels, you benefit from the time of all the other members collective collaborative effort of the group is what gives you the time to learn, the capacity to process the volume of opportunities, and perhaps most importantly, the chance to enjoy it all, to have a bit of fun. Melbourne Angels has invested in more than 75 companies in over 600 individual investments. Typically, we invest in pre-revenue ventures at a key value inflection point. That's usually revenue, but it depends on the sector and business model. Portfolio companies that are succeeding, it is not uncommon that we support them through four or five rounds of investment. Successful companies in our portfolio today are currently valued at 10, 20, and even 40 times our original investment value. More than 13% of our deals produce exits, which include trade sales like Rome to Rio, ASX listings, script based mergers, debt redemptions, and of course, some simple shutdowns. We have one or two pitch meetings every month at Melbourne Angels. Our members on our screening team meet every week to complete that triage, to compare notes on the founders that they are coaching, and to select the opportunities for pitching to the whole group. Our membership team delivers the best angel training workshops in Australia throughout the year, and every member has access to an extensive array of online training and reference materials. The members on our investment team are an expert resource within the group to support our screening team advise our deal leads, sanity check our investment terms, and guide our portfolio engagement. To start angel investing, you should be 
able and willing to invest at least one or two investments per year for five years to develop that concurrent portfolio of 10 investments. Now, depending on your circumstances and your investment thesis, you may well invest at a much higher rate and for a much larger portfolio. An angel group should provide you with the volume and diversity of deal flow to enable you to build that portfolio. Melbourne Angels typically does around 20 transactions a year, more than half of which are first round investments, while the balance are follow on rounds, supporting our successful portfolio companies. Investing in startups, the people are both the most important and the hardest piece of the puzzle. The diverse experience and skills of an angel group are invaluable in effectively and efficiently evaluating the founders and their teams. Angel investing is focused on aligning our interests with those of the founders and alignment towards shared future success. The angel group process and legal documents are all designed to achieve that alignment. Usually in an angel group, you decide which investments you'll make and how much to invest. The collaborative process ensures all the angels share the due diligence, invest on the same terms and contribute to supporting the portfolio companies. In a member-led angel group, like Melbourne Angels, the members do the work of organising our events and running the group. At Melbourne Angels, our members are active in the startup community as founders, business leaders, mentors, advisors, and more. Our training workshops are designed for Australia, created and delivered by internationally respected angel investors. These workshops are free to members, open to other startup investors, heavily discounted for founders, and available to anyone interested to learn the art and skills of investing in startups. In fact, it's not uncommon for more than a third of the participants in our workshops to be startup founders. At Melbourne Angels, you will find a professional, collegiate and ethical community of like-minded peers. Joining an angel group can't guarantee you will make a great investment. It can help you avoid the bad ones. It will most definitely allow you to enjoy the fun and adventure of investing in startups. If you want to be an angel, or if you've already started on your own, please contact us at Melbourne Angels to join our welcoming, supportive, diverse and inclusive community. I look forward to investing alongside. The venture capital market is notorious for its illiquidity. Unlike that of public markets, investors don't have that power to buy and sell with speed and transparency. As an investor with existing equity in a company, this means, one, it's harder to restructure and rebalance your portfolio as you would in public markets, and two, it's near impossible to liquidate equity ahead of the business's intended exit. Essentially, your cash is stuck in stocks. On the other side of the coin, there are investors who are looking to enter later stage opportunities. However, those opportunities have already closed their doors to funding rounds. And if they do reopen, they're usually reserved for venture capital firms, existing investors, or private equity firms. This means there is a high and expensive barrier to entry. So with both these problems in mind, we have worked to launch the WI Capital's secondaries platform. Utilizing our network of 30,000 plus high net worth and sophisticated investors and combining that with the CRISP software, an underlying technology that helps streamline and facilitate these transactions. And it's already working. We are open for business and our clients are well underway in establishing their own secondaries markets. So if you're looking for options to sell existing equity in a company, or you want to see our most recent catalog of secondary investment opportunities, Feel free to contact us via the email on screen or reach out to us via the Brella booth for the remainder of the VNC conference. A big welcome to the VNC audience. We have a series of exciting and unique investment opportunities lined up for you today ranging from med and biotech, healthcare, energy, STEM, and other emerging technologies. The showcase will begin shortly. If at any moment a company piques your interest, feel free to reach out to them on the Brella platform or the Chris Dill Room. Enjoy.
Good afternoon. This is Thomas Schlumberger. I'm the CEO of Pictor Diagnostics, and I think I can bring you a very attractive investment opportunity to you today. Pictor has developed a novel platform with a novel antibody test that will help to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. The Pictor investment proposition is to raise 7 million New Zealand dollars on a 31.7 New Zealand million dollars pre-money valuation. Uh, the goal for the company is to achieve a trade sale for New Zealand dollars 150 million to New Zealand dollars 200 million within the next 12 to 18 months, which would yield an expected return for investors between 3.25x and 4.25x within 12 to 18 months. The Pictor system consists of three different parts. It is the Pictor array where the patient sample is uh, uh, dispensed and processed. The Pict imager, CL2, which is a reader that reads the signals and data from the Pict array. And the pictorial software that analyzes the, so uh, the signals and the data and yields the result to the lab personnel or to any kind of medical personnel. The problem is twofold. Currently, the data show that the immunity following an, a, an infection or vaccination lasts up to six to eight months. After that, the antibody level subsides and the protection against the reinfection disappears. Monitoring the antibody status with a COVID-19 antibody test from, from Pictor will help to determine when the right time is for revaccination and will help to get protection for people without any gap. The other part of the problem is that people without, without any infection and getting two shots of the vaccine have much lower anti-level protection compared to people that had a former infection and get just one shot of vaccine. So a lot of shots of vaccines are currently wasted and the Pictor test will help to address this. The solution to these two problems is the Pictor COVID-19 antibody assay. Pictor has used its, multiplies, its, its multiplex technology to develop a COVID-19 antibody test. The technology and the test itself are patent protected. The test is highly accurate. Um, it is very low cost, high throughput, and provides greater utility for clinicians because it can uniquely distinguish and discriminate between a vaccine-induced uh, immunity and infection-induced immunities. The initial results of the test have shown 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity, which is uh, a perfect accuracy. Um, again, the Pictor test has high performance, high throughput, low cost, and uh, has a differentiation that other tests on the market do not have. Looking at the low cost, Pictor can actually uh, provide a test that measures antibody against the spike and the nucleocapsid protein in one well for roughly $3 US. Other competitors that would have to use two different tests to get a measurement against antibodies against the spike and antibodies against the nucleocapsid protein are currently asking between $20 and $40 in the market, which is about six to 10 times higher than what Pictor can deliver to the market. The route to market is twofold. We are uh, trying to get an emergency use authorization in the US and the MHRA uh, uh, authorization in the European Union and will go to market in the US and the EU through partnerships. For India and New Zealand, we will have small sale forces that go direct to laboratories and generate revenue that way. The current timelines are is we're in the middle of alpha trials to determining the cutoffs for the test. Uh, then in, in September, we will go through the lab developed test route and get early revenue and early data from the US labs. In September, October, we will do uh, external validation with US labs with three sites. Uh, and then in October, November, uh, the data acquisition and the EUA 
Submission will follow with an expected market clearance in the US and in the EU in January 2022. Here is a picture of the estimated revenues and sales for the LDT route, the lab developed test route. We expect about $100,000 per month through early revenues. Uh, for the emergency use authorized IBD route, we expect about a million uh, 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 US dollar revenue per month. And all these labs that are on the slide have relationships with PICTOR and are awaiting for the PICTOR COVID-19 antibody test. Here is a, a snapshot of the for sales forecast for 2021, 2022. Um, it is a total of about 9.5 million New Zealand dollars. As you can see, the majority of the revenue comes from the COVID-19 antibody IgG test and from the US uh, geography. However, there are other revenues through products being launched in the Indian market, and it overall sums up to 9.5 million New Zealand dollars. The PICTOR leadership team consists of Thomas Schlumberger, Howard Moore, Richard Genesco, and Sanjay Chakraborty. Together, uh, these four people have uh, a an, an combined IBD experience of 74 years, and Thomas Schlumberger has built and transacted several companies before. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please reach out to our Chief Operating Officer, Howard Moore. Uh, the information and the contact data are here in the slide. Again, thank you for your time, and I look forward to hearing from you. You already know that stress and anxiety are the most significant root causes of illness and cost the world trillions. The holy grail is to alleviate the corrosive effects of stress without medication or dependency on talking therapies. Certainly meditation is very effective if conducted expertly, but only a tiny percentage of us apparently are able to establish regular meditation practice. Eminent physicians have found that the silver bullet to stress resilience and alleviation is what is referred to as good vagal nerve tone. From now on, I'm sure you'll hear a lot about the vagus nerve, that's V-A-G-U-S, and that might even change your life. So far, this has only been possible using expensive equipment and special in specialist clinics like the Kushnak practice or the Mayo Clinic um, or the New Medicine Group. What you'll hear about now is a much needed disruptor and problem solver for the world of stress. I'm Anna Gudmundsen, the co-founder and CEO of Biosoft Technology, which is the maker of Sensate. My background is all in tech uh, at every stage from startup to multinational, including turnaround CEO and leading development of pivotal marketing technologies. Let me introduce you to my co-founder, Stefan Schmelik. He founded the biggest integrated health group in the UK, um, in Holly Street, which is like the Wall Street of top medical specialists in the UK. He is a physician with 30 years of clinical experience working with tens of thousands of patients with stress and trauma related conditions. In other words, Stefan is the real deal. Stefan, please tell us about Sensate. We've had a vagus nerve for around 500 million years, but a human brain for only about the last 1 million years. So our primitive vagus is infinitely more deeply hardwired into our threat response than our human brain. Put simply, the vagus nerve controls the stress response. We know that good vagal nerve tone is the single biggest contributor to recovery and ongoing well-being of patients suffering from the overwhelming effects of stress and anxiety. My challenge was to find a non-invasive, consumer-friendly way of improving vagal nerve tone that can reach the hundreds of millions of people who need it versus the few affluent people who can come to our clinic. This is how it works. You recline and you place the sensate on your chest, on the sternum. You choose a session from the app, headphones on, you sit back, and you allow the sensate to do its work. 
The Sensei device emits infrasonic vibration synchronized with sound and frequencies to your ears. The outcome is a physiological response leading to profound calm within 10 minutes in virtually all users. It just works. 90.5% of survey respondents found that Sensate was equal to or more effective for stress, anxiety, and insomnia when compared to prescribed drugs, meditation, breathing exercises, or other relaxation technology. In the clinic, this level of physiological activation requires an array of technology. Sensate eliminates the kit by turning the body into a sound instrument using bone conduction and thoracic amplification to target the nervous system, specifically the vagus nerve stress response. As we all know, there is a very large market out there. We launched the very first Sensate device and app in 2019, and we're selling online direct to consumer. We already have over 14,000 customers. Our cash efficiency means that we've got this far on only 1.5 million US dollars. The next stage is to introduce a premium subscription and transition the full offering towards a subscription-based business model by Q2 next year. Obviously, this both benefits the user in terms of a lower barrier to entry and it increases the lifetime value. Ultimately, we're building an ecosystem of products and digital services that will provide sustainable growth in an incalculably large market. We're on track for $4.2 million in revenue this year and our current race will help hit those targets. The size of the market together with our traction and importantly the evidence in terms of our outstanding usage numbers allow us to be quite ambitious over the next five years. This will be supported by our recurring revenue model. There's a near-term opportunity to participate in a SAFE, that's a simple agreement for future equity, which will close end of August or when filled. We're raising 700,000 US dollars and we're more than halfway there already. Um, the SAFE offers preferential valuation cap and a discount for the participating investors. The minimum ticket size we're asking for is 50K. Both of our VCs, um, that's Time One Time Ventures and Unlock Venture Partners are participating, which offers some comfort in terms of DD. And if you think that this breakthrough consumer technology is something that you care about and would like to join, please let us know very soon. We look forward to connecting with you. Hello and welcome. My name is Richard Maloney. I'm the founder and CEO of Quality Mind Global. At Quality Mind Global, we are currently revolutionizing the personal development industry. I'm going to start with a short story that's important to this pitch. At the age of 18, I made it to the elite level of the AFL here in Australia. However, however unfortunately, I was spat out by the system. And that forced me into a very deep, introspective journey at the time. And on that journey, I was asked big questions such as, why are we here on the planet? And what is my role? Which led me to going on a very deep, personal, mystical and spiritual journey for the next 10 years or so. Along that way, I worked with over 150 sports teams around Australia and assisted 40 teams to win championships, with the most notable team being the Western Bulldogs in the AFL, where I was the leadership and culture coach for three years. So part of my introspection was how do we succeed the quickest? And I first began with reverse engineering all the successful teams I'd helped create. I then systemized this and titled it the Group Activation System. So in 2014, I then launched Engage and Grow Global, which is now seen as the number one employee engagement licensing company in the world, where I systemized my IP and built custom technology and then licensed and trained over 700 business coaches and HR managers from 35 countries over a four-year period. Along the way, I was recognized as a finalist in both Optus and Telstra Business Awards multiple times. I've since sold this company. I've also been recognized quite often in the media, and these are the books that I've authored. So the problem I started to notice along the way in working in the personal development industry is the industry is too slow and most often does not create sustainable change. 
teachings are outdated and business, life and sports coaches do not have the most updated mental wellness tools to help people quickly become the best version of themselves. And the problem becomes obvious when you look at what people are searching for over the last few years. In the US, a 75% growth searching monthly for mental health programs, and then over 100% growth when it comes to searching mental health. And the very similar numbers here in Australia. And because of my years of trial and error and working with thousands of clients, I saw a niche and designed the personal activation system. And this behavioral change system has five critical steps that our clients go through to fast track their transformation. And as you can see, four of the five steps have a heavy tech component. And what this means, it's the mind mentor that leads the clients through the program with the tech actually playing the dominant role. Only 20% of our programs are delivered by the mind mentors through systemized teachings, and 80% is driven by our custom tech. So the tech and the client are actually working together outside of the teachings to quickly help them transform. The My Mentor is purely guiding them in a very systematic, systematic way during live weekly group coaching sessions. This means that the My Mentor can run multiple group programs with hundreds of people attending. When it comes to our competitors, our IP and tech provides a whole suite of services. Whereas our competitors' tech systems are only addressing a small part. And that's why our systems are proving so successful. So we have two customers, the mind mentor that leads the program and the participants in the program. And if you look carefully here, there's me training our mind mentors online. And there's Bruce Wilson down here from New Zealand, if you can see my cursor. And there's Bruce transferring all the information and the systemized IP to his group coaching clients. When it comes to the mind mentors, this is our revenue structure. They come in and they refer each other in, which I'll talk about in just a second, which is a key component to our business model. We get them through online workshops and soon to be live events. They join us for a three-year license at $20,000 and we give them lead generation and business coaching should they choose. And along the way, when they get clients on board, we take 20 to 30% of all their revenue from their client fees. We also request a monthly $150 tech fee. It's built as a low risk, easy entry with a focus on wealth creation for both the mind mentor and for us. When it comes to our participants, this is our revenue structure. Our marketing dr brings them in through online and soon to be live events again, and we start them in a 12 week behavioral change program, $2,000. We find that 10 to 15% of all our clients will join us as a mind mentor and step up to become a licensee. <clears throat> and then either or, they step up into a six-month program, usually speaking, for $1,000, and then into a reoccurring fee that goes on continuously. Our clients become hooked as Quality Mind becomes a way of life. So we're always designing programs to keep them sticky. So our company purpose, quite simply, is to train and license thousands of mind mentors to rapidly awaken people across the globe to live their true potential. Over the last six months, we've earned more than we did the previous 12 months, and this was all achieved when the world was stricken down with COVID. In 2020, our focus was end user customer to get the required traction and success stories. We accomplished this, and please feel free to Google research us. We have over 100 client five-star reviews. Now, in 2021 and going forward, our focus is recruiting mind mentors. And this is seen in the growth of the light blue there uh, in license fees. But in time, our lion's share of revenue will all come from program fees because we'll be recruiting more mind mentors. We've got fantastic organic growth around the world today in the last two years with paying customers in all these countries. And our main focus really is an expansion through the US. And here is our global expansion plans over the next three or four years with the key milestones in yellow. You see, we're looking for 150 mind mentors recruited by then, and then up to 850. And so this is a, a bit more deeper dive into our numbers, but feel free, I can send these to you. We can go through these at a later date, but the most important numbers are in the yellow. So the key here is really up here with our mind mentors. Our mind mentor model is designed so the mind mentors are financially incentivized to bring in more mind mentors, which allows them to create their own virtual teams so they can create a passive income for themselves, but only for two levels down. So Faith, for instance, we had 150 mind mentors in by year two and conservatively saying they all have 80 clients going through a program in 12 months. That's 12,000 plus clients going through our programs. And then 
838, going through 80 clients each. That's a minimum, and that's very conservative for what we're seeing at the moment. That's 67,000 clients going through our programs. And this is why it's important, because we take between 20 and 30% of all our client fees, and they can see the considerable jump. Also, the other major revenue stream here is the licensee fees that come through. So looking at the bar chart here, you'll see 150 My Mentors and then 883. And the key here with middle expenses as it's 100% online business. When it comes to our team, we have an office here in Brighton, Victoria. We have an operations manager, Kira Lee, who's a shareholder uh, and a communications manager, admin assistants, and a highly recognized business coach who has been chosen as the number one business coach in the world for the last nine years in a row. And Sean Higgins, who's an elite athlete with the Geelong Football Club, a shareholder as well. Now to the ask. We are seeking $1 million for a 10% shareholder, and this revenue go towards our global expansion plans, which will fuel these three key areas. We're also after an investor or consortium who can assist us to open doors. So we need, they need to be an influence in the media, in the business circles, or in the sports industry. This is only as a consultancy role, not as a daily operations. So in summary, I have proven industry experience. The key to quality mine is the tech drives the change. The global wellness market right now is worth $4.5 trillion and the number one growth industry. We have 50 countries already with organic growth, and we're looking for offering a four times return on investment in four years. So I've been through a process of developing IP and tech to quickly advance team improvement via my group activation system. And now I'm bringing the, to the world my personal activation system. The reason is that over my 20 years journey in the human performance industry, this critical area of life is not being addressed as effectively as it can be. So I've designed the new way forward and it works every time. And the beauty of it, most of it is delivered by tech, which means our my mentors can manage 80, 160, 300 clients a year comfortably. We have customers that, are, that pay, we have my mentors that pay, and we derive our revenue from all parties, and then we support the my mentor through the journey. Thank you for your time. I'd like If you'd like to meet or chat further, here are my details. You can screenshot that or you can find more information on the Chris platform. Hi, I'm Phil Goodwin, co-founder of Body Mind Life Online, and a really big thanks to Wholesale Investor for the opportunity to present our business to you. We are a video creation SaaS platform for teachers in the yoga, Pilates, and wellness industry that provides tools and community building features for them to connect with and monetize their student networks and our shared network. While our competitors focus on the top 1% of teachers, we focus on supporting the other 99% of educators who make up the world's growing passion and creator economy that has suddenly grown with COVID and forced a change of habits. July was our first full month of trading. Students are coming back three times per week and watching 147 minutes of content. We are serving 500 plus hours of content daily. We paid teachers real money, 25,000 in July, one of our top KPIs, proving we can become a real income stream for teachers. We also generated 52,000 in revenue for that month. We are tapping into the change where teachers now believe online is a valid way to deliver classes and students also accept this now with more than 50 teachers on the platform and 30 in the pipeline. We have reached out to some major corporates and signed up four with 50,000 staff being invited to trial the platform in August. We raised 600,000 in December to develop the technology. Beta launched in April and launched June. We are raising money now to grow and open up internationally with our significant connections into the US and European markets and to meet the existing demands of, of our teachers. Let's dive into things in a little bit more detail. Pre-COVID, only a few teachers were online as studio teaching was considered the norm. The new norm is now online today. All believe they can teach anytime, anywhere, and follow their passion. 
not just wellness teachers, but educators and passionate creatives in general understand their power and potential online. The problem is COVID made this shift happen quickly, not over years. In the first round of COVID, teachers believed it would go back to normal, but the new normal is, it sta is establishing itself. It's a new world. This has created an environment where educators in the passion and creative economies are trying to find easy and profitable ways to connect with students online and offline. We think about teachers as a product, as this is a market in its own right, a subtle and profound shift in thinking. Teachers were at best considered a customer and at worst an employee within the industry. They now hold the balance of power in the relationship between studios, customers and teachers. It's this tectonic shift in our industry that we are tapping into right now. We have found that teachers need a full suite of tools as they just don't have the skills to bring many systems together. This is part of the problem, but they also don't have large enough networks themselves to be sustainable, which we bring via our shared networks. Students want to interact with a number of teachers, not just one. Again, the benefit of teachers being part of a platform, not just going solo as they think they need to do at the moment. And finally, teachers need to make real money from this. We are already seeing some teachers earning $300 per class from our platform for only an hour's work, and we are only just getting started. To help the community, we will reach out to corporates, an area teachers struggle to capture. We are already talking internationally to reach about 500,000 students, and we seem to have hit the mark at the right time. But long term, we need to go beyond the online to linking students and teachers both online and offline with new studio business models suited to this new environment. The next step is we have a network of students and teachers which creates a closed ecosystem that we can grow sidestepping traditional payment gateways that charge up to 4 or 5% for transactions. Now for a recheck on the market. The problem is most products were built pre-COVID and will find it hard to change as you now have teachers which were in limited supply before. They then controlled what was produced and was at mass scale to students, which actually became boring over time for students. The community and influencer products are where you are acting as a business person, but teachers aren't business people or self-promoters. They are teachers who care about their passion. It's about empowering connection between students and teachers while scaling the business. When you dig into this, yes, it's a big market that we are involved in, but the real game is supporting people who have become more aware of their own health and wellness and are looking for effective ways to improve. We have found that students want a variety of teachers, so as their journey develops and grows, so do their needs. Our platform supports the new believers, both students and teacher. In the US, there are 100,000 yoga teachers registered on the Peak Body website. That's just yoga teachers. It's called Yoga Alliance. And at, le and at last count, 55 million regular practitioners. Our first target is five, 500 high value teachers within the next 12 months. Our big audacious goal is 10,000 teachers. 500 teachers to us means one and a half million in MRR. We spent much of 2020 working on this idea, but in December, we pushed the go hard button, raised 600,000 and started building the team. Released the beta in April and went live in June. We have grown fast and now are growing at five to 10% per week with more teachers wanting to come on and the corporates helping to grow our student base beyond what the teachers are bringing in. One of our key success metrics is how much we have paid teachers. So far, we have paid 25,000 to teachers already and an additional 5,000 to our teacher partners that have begun activating their own audiences through our motivating referral and affiliate program. In July, we did 52,000 in revenue as mentioned. We know where we are going with 500 teachers by this time next year and reaching our 1.5 in monthly recurring revenue targets. But to fully realize this, 
We need funds to go hard instead of bootstrapping, which we could do, but we also need help to do this right. So all win and we reach the goal of 10,000 teachers globally in three years, if not sooner. We have built an extraordinary team of 11 that gives us the breadth of skills and passion to execute our vision to help teachers succeed. We've also started building out our team to the next level to have full success. But the part we are proud of is the investors we brought on to start with, as they not only understand the passion needed to succeed here, but also have the knowledge we are tapping into to give us the result we all want. The funds we raise will be will be to grow the tools for teachers and help to grow them and their students. We already have a list of who we want with a focus now on teachers as they are our real product. Thank you and make sure you access the QR code below Hi, my name's Mark Gabalotto and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Primal Organics. Primal Organics has developed a, a brand new innovative product that is currently uh, been selling for the last three years in the retail market through independent pharmacies, medicinal cannabis dispensaries and health food stores. The first product that I want to talk about is our anxiety product. And this particular product is an innovative product, all natural all terpene-based medicine, and it has helped thousands and thousands of people manage their anxiety on the spot. This product works quite simple. Put it under your tongue for 30 seconds. It goes into your bloodstream, into your central nervous system, straight up into your receptors, and it manages anxiety in 30 seconds. This is one of our biggest selling products over the last three years. We have been doing research and development on not only this product, but multiple products, which I'll share in a moment. And in every financial year over the last three years, we've been able to access tens of thousands of dollars. In the last three financial year, we received from Oz Industries $33,000 on our first year of doing R&D for this extraordinary product. In the second year, it went up to 48,000. And this current financial year being the 2021 financial year, we're about to receive $72,000 already for our products that have already sold over 20,000 units Australia-wide, both through the retail, independent pharmacies, health food stores, and medicinal cannabis dispensaries, and online. We sell a lot of products online. And the best part about these products is that these products are a high profit margin. We manufacture this product at our own manufacturing facility where we've created all these products doing our R&D. Our manufacturing cost is $6.50 per unit to manufacture. We sell this online and through our retail outlets, $65 per unit. So the margin, the gross profit margin is absolutely huge. We've done over $200,000 in the last financial year and the financial year before. And our, our model to scale over the next 18 months is to go from $200,000 in revenues to $2 million in revenues. We've already sold over 20,000 of these units and we're about to sell 50,000 units to hit our $2 million mark. We need money to invest into packaging, ingredients, products to GMP our facility and upgrade our machinery to start producing thousands more units per day to service an industry that is crying out for our anxiety, positive mental health range products of anxiety, calm, engage, which is for um, anti-depression and social anxiety, and our number one selling product that we released December last year, sleep. Most people are having problems sleeping with the realities of COVID, and this product is already moving so quickly we can't keep up with demand. As I said, the profit margin is high. Now, for us to scale to the next level, we need to increase 
our monthly spend, which is currently anywhere between 300, 350 per month to up to $2,000 a month. We want to get an average monthly spend from around $500 a month through our wholesale accounts up to $1,000 a month. And we want to go from 60 wholesale accounts in the next 18 months to 500 at an average spend of $500 a month. And for us to do this, our model that we are currently using in Western Australia is that we employ part-time naturopaths who are currently working in a health food store. And as they are working in that health food store, they become the ambassador of our range of products. And then they are working in that health store selling our product and they then work for us part-time and they are managing around two dozen accounts in an area like Perth. We are currently selling this way in Perth, South Australia, Victoria and Tasmania and our growth strategy to scale to go to $2 million in the next 18 months both obviously online and wholesale accounts and major accounts, is to have multiple naturopaths working in Townsville, Brisbane, Sunshine Coast, Go Coast, uh, Byron Bay, Sydney, West Sydney, North Sydney, uh, and all those areas. And they are working in the health food store, independent pharmacies or medicinal cannabis dispensary. They become the ambassador. They are selling the products and they then are servicing a range of other wholesale accounts around that. Our other way to, uh, to scale, to go to the next level, to this $2 million figure that we want to do in the next 18 months is our online platform. We're already selling online. We have an e-commerce site. Feel free to go to our website, www.primalorganics.com.au. Check out our products there. We're selling products online. It's great. Our repeat orders and repeat buys are fantastic. But our online strategy that we're about to embark is we're going to test how and what it costs us to acquire over 1,000 customers. And when we finish this campaign to sell 1,000 units online at $65, which gives us our highest greatest margin, we'll be able to then analyse that data and then we want to duplicate that by 100 times around Australia and then globally. Our, our entrance into then major distributors being the independent pharmacies, the next level pharmacies, and then the large pharmacies, including, you know, Chemist Warehouse. And then you talk about Safeway, Woolies, Costco's. We've already been in discussions with their health buyers. We have these contacts. We have the introductions. Unfortunately, we can't supply nor bankroll the demand of the product, hence why we're trying to raise $2 million. Once we've done this in the next 18 months, it then positions us absolutely beautifully to go for an IPO and then once we IPO, then to do uh, mergers, acquisitions and company buyouts. Our company is now positioned in a global anxiety market that is a billion, multi-billion dollar market and when you look at the players outside of pharmaceutical products, there is nobody doing what we are doing currently with an innovative range of products that work on the endocannabinoidia system, exactly like medicinal cannabis, but they are legal. They are, you, know, you won't, if you get tested for drugs, if you've got to go into work and whatnot, you won't come up with any reading. So people love these products because they are better than medicinal cannabis. If you'd like to find out more information about primal organics, please come to our crisp deal room. Make contact with me. We've got so much information about our 1.6 million shares sold today. Who are those investors? Who's invested into the company? Our competitive strategy, timing, right, uh, the right product, right timing, how to strategize, all that information, our distribution model, everything is in the back end of the crisp deal room. You'll be able to see the overview. You'll be able to see our R&D grants. You'll be able to meet our management team uh, across the board and our ability to scale a high profit margin product is ready to go. So if you're an investor who's ready to go and want to be in the health space and you are looking for a company that's 
not about to develop a product to you know raise money to develop a product. If you if you're ready to invest into a company that is sold over twenty thousand units and ready to scale our anxiety range globally, both online and through wholesale accounts, major accounts, and international accounts, please reach out to us in our Chris Steele. Tana Farm is an Australian public company, which is to list on the Sydney Stock Exchange and the Deutsche Börse in Frankfurt. Um, our management team is um, myself as executive chairman, Adrian Love as uh, marketing and business development director, and Matthew Carabot is our agronomist. He is also um, the chief scientific officer. Right, Tana Farm at Glance, Australian registered company, licenses in Lesotho, South Africa and Zimbabwe and joint venture agreements with our local partners there. Potential cultivation of 90.5 hectares um, and the company is led by serial entrepreneurs, agriculture experts and financial experts. Africa is positioned to take a leading role in the supply of quality cannabis to the EU. Um, it's it got an excellent climate in southern, in southern Africa and um, really very good agricultural land, um, so it's well positioned to supply the EU. The EU demand for GMP approved cannabis is actually exceeding supply, which makes it um, very advantageous for us growing in Southern Africa. The solution is, is for, for the shortage of medical cannabis is high quality cannabis from third, third world countries. Um, and but producing a quality crop, GMP approved and GACP approved. The fields of application of medical cannabis are many, but really for chronic pain, cancer side effects, um, sleep disorder, to mention a few, um, but they're all there in the slide. Botana Farm are positioned as a potential market leader. Yeah, and we, our certification um, compliance is extremely important. Uh, we have um, our, our ISO 9001 coming this week. We've completed that process and very shortly thereafter, we'll have GAP and GACP. Yeah, so Botana Farm has uh, obtained licenses in three jurisdictions, namely uh, Lesotho, South Africa and Zimbabwe. Uh, the advantage of growing in the Southern African region is uh, three points. Uh, the uh, great fund growing climate, uh, skilled labor within the agricultural sector, and a very low cost base. Uh, in Lesotho, we have a <clears throat> joint venture on a 25 hectare piece of land uh, in a special economic zone, uh, where we have shared infrastructure with other operators. Uh, in South Africa, we have a 5.5 hectare piece of land uh, just under an hour from the uh, Oa Tambo Airport in uh, Gauteng. Uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, we are on Carolina Estates uh, on a 30, piece, 30 hectare piece of land on a former tobacco farm and uh, wildlife game park as well, which is about 27 kilometers from uh, the main airport in Harare. Um, the growth strategy is very straightforward. Uh, it's to essentially phase out the growing strategy uh, and eventually end up with at least 10 hectares in each location uh, on a phased out process. Uh, we will be growing a, a double seed planting uh, within Dutch buckets uh, in poly tunnels. Uh, in the future, we intend to expand into sales into Europe uh, through Malta. The amount we're asking for is um, two million dollars, but we can't accept um, up to two point five million. This will be done under a prospectus. Prospectus has been finalised now, probably lodged with ASIC in the middle of um, September. There's also a small amount of PIP funding available, and um, which was done at five cents actually. Investment highlights: um, the market is backed by government in all three countries. 
which makes it much easier to operate there. Um, we have, we're using cutting edge artificial intelligence um, so we can monitor the growing of the crops from anywhere in the world. Um, we have a strong financial prof profile and we will be debt free um, and we'll have substantial income from, from crop sales. Um, we are um, expanding through area enlargement. There's lots of land available where we are and we will be um, extending to other African countries as well. The management um, is, has, has had experience of 10 plus successful IPOs in the past 20 years, and, and we're very experienced in building companies. Hi everyone, Steve Placateris is my name. I am the CEO and Managing Director of Dr. Mark's Hygiene, a personal care brand in the oral hygiene space. So Dr. Mark's Hygiene has developed and now distributes a patented, innovative range of super easy to use, purpose designed products for the aftercare of removable dental appliances. That would be home aftercare, institutional aftercare of products like dentures, sports mouth guards, anything that goes in and out of the mouth temporarily. Our mission, reduce the physical and emotional and financial costs of poor RDA care. Our vision as a company, as a business, is to be recognized as the leader by professionals and consumers as the leader in this category. So what's the problem? Why does the world need Dr. Mark's hygiene? Well, it's widely acknowledged that dentures, mouth guards, most all RDAs are inadequately cleaned and cared for after purchase. What's not widely acknowledged is the consequences of that poor care or why it's happening. So what's the real cost of the problem? Well, the real cost of the problem is the consequence of poor oral hygiene. So poor care and hygiene of RDAs can produce poor oral hygiene. Oral hygiene then translates into oral disease and oral disease is inextricably linked to serious maladies of the mouth, the throat, the lungs, the heart, such as aspirational pneumonia or diabetes or uh, cardiovascular disease. Until now, there hasn't been a brand, product or concept that's totally focused and totally committed on fixing those problems until now. So what's the solution? How did we come up with the solution? Well, Dr. Mark Witherspoon invented the hygiene concept to help his father look after his mother's dentures as they got older and couldn't do it the old fashioned way. Our solution is also unique in the market because it straddles both the professional marketplace and the consumer marketplace. From a business, it doubles the size of our potential market, but also brings the professional into our fold as the ad advocate for our brand. Why does this work? What's the secret behind why ours works? Well, it's first of all, the world's only purpose designs all in one system. It has a, the, the method and the concept is anchored in the therapeutic guidelines, which suggest brushing, Soap paste washing and dry storage are the three key ingredients in optimum denture hygiene. Here's, a, here's an interesting ta table that I, I really wanna spend some time on. These five protocols are the top protocols for denture care around the world. Rinsing with water, soaking tablets, toothbrush, electric toothbrush and denture brush used with toothpaste which by the way is designed for teeth, not for dentures. The Dr. Mark's Hygiene product and concept, concept and product range is the only one in the protocol that is fast, thorough, safe, and has that built-in dry storage element. The market size and the market potential is enormous. 
um, I could spend an hour talking about the market size. But the upshot is in Australia and the United States alone, there are 45 million denture wearers, close to 80 million denture, denture and mouth guard wearers. That's just those two RDA categories in those two markets. Now we're projecting 2026 sales of unit sales representing 5% of the combined 2.9 billion US and Australian denture and mouth guard market. 2.9 billion dentures and mouth guards only, Australia, United States only. Who's going to manage all that? Well, you've got to have a, 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 a very good board and management team, and we do. We have three very firm and experienced hands at the wheel. Between myself, Dr. Mark Weatherspoon, and Philip Wass, our CFO, we have over 100 years of experience in the required disciplines to prosecute a business plan and our business plan and roll this business into the U.S. market to the degree that we know it can be. To that end, since launching, you know, what we've managed to do since launching in November is we're currently actively trading in these seven countries and we are progressing distribution discussions in Canada, Germany, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates. These are also some of the companies that we are trading with worldwide. What's our funding requirements? So following our successful previous raise of 1.9 million, grant funding from both the New South Wales and Commonwealth governments of 1.2 million. In light of those previous successes, we're now seeking 10 million of funding in exchange for 50% interest in the business. And a minimum commitment of 500,000, which helps, keeps us, helps keep our business in the private business, uh, the private company sector. A post money valuation of 20 million, which is based on the $10 million capital raise. Now, evaluation is based on a combination of addressing a global problem, a significant global health problem, our forecasted earnings, and the patented technology and intellectual property stable that we have around the world. Funding priorities and distributions. Uh, you know, rather than talk about producing molds or launch promotional marketing, I'll condense it down to the funding priority for us and the distribution priorities for us is the expansion of the business into the lucrative U.S. wholesale market. We want to build powerfully on what we've already establishing in the United States and in other markets around the world. The milestone roadmap is there to, to just firmly suggest that we have a plan. The management team and myself have a very strong plan for at least the next 18 months in milestone projects that will help get this business rolled into the U.S. at the level that we want it to be by 2026. So what are the investment highlights? Well, we're talking about a major health breakthrough in the care of dental appliances. And again, there are millions upon millions of dental appliance wearers around the world. We're doing that with patented technology. We have two patents on our designs and a stable of additional intellectual property and target, key target markets. Those would be target markets that we intend to trade in or manufacture in. The product range has been thoroughly tested in the Australian market and is already producing significant international sales with some formidable, formidable distribution businesses. Our back office and e-commerce systems are, are customized for our business. We have built them ourselves. We don't use any out-of-the-box licensed technology. Our systems are suited for our business. They are scalable for the growth of our business. We have a lean, mean, and very experienced management team to prosecute the business plan. Forecasted profits in year three with year five profits more than doubling the current valuation. The management team is committed to an exit, exit plan in the future. And the option, we also have options for capital structure that may provide access to early stage innovation company tax provisions. And that's it. That's it for me. I invite you to come to our crisp deal room where you're going to find a lot more information about the business, about myself, Mark Weatherspoon, Philip Wass. You have direct access to us in the deal room, and we'd love to hear from you there. Thanks once again.
Hi, my name is Ottavio Cimino. I'm the co-founder of Aura Australia. We are very proud to present to you an investment opportunity into a profitable and socio-ecological business project. My co-founders and I have accumulated 30 years of experience in technology development, manufacturing and commercialization of domestic cooking appliances. Aura is an innovative company that develops, manufactures and commercializes a range of revolutionary world-first products under the Aura brand for the international market. Or has identified a series of limitations and deficiency with competitors' product. This deficiency relates to energy inefficiency, uneven cooking, especially for ovens, limited safety technology, especially for gas appliances. There is an interest in demand by consumers for higher cooking performance appliances. Furthermore, venue to market operators such as retailers, interior designers, kitchen cabinet makers, and builders are seeking alternative products that feature better performance energy saving, and trendy style. Aura has developed a range of world-first products that have a strong appeal with consumers, featuring smart technology that include improved end cooking quality, improved safety performance, reduction in cooking time, reduction in energy consumption, and slick design. Aura product range include a series of world-first products that solve problems in a revolutionary way, including induction, thermic, heating oven that offer, compared to the competition, 30% in energy saving, 40% faster cooking time, while improving the end cooking results. Smart gas hob with touch control fitted with triple mechatronic safety system, an electronic self-diagnosis that automatically reports to the consumer and or a customer care of any malfunction, including service scheduling. Range hoods that purifies the ambient air with, with wind and summer mode, while drastically reducing the noise level. All this technology are fitted to Aura freestanding stove, including built-in range. The appliance market is very large and mature. In order to enter the marketplace with the new, mar new brand, it is not only essential and critical to promote revolutionary technology, but also to have a flexible business model that controls some key aspects as follows. Marketing edge. No other competitors around the world are either manufacturing or marketing any of Aura innovation. Protection of our own IP will be secured by seven patents and two registered design. The business model is and will be strictly based on ecological, ecological sustainability. That includes energy saving, reduction in emission, consumers' well-being, and conformance with the circular economy. Aura Pro Range innovations are aligned with market trends. Aura R&D plan aims to innovate and to adapt its product offer ahead of future market trends. Marketing is and will be focused on target consumer who are mature and ready for Aura technology by offering additional accommodating pre- and post-sale services. Market, market activity will be focused in Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, USA and Canada. The total market size is 225 million units sold per annum. Aura target market size of the smart appliances is 11 million units per annum. Smart technology is used is generally focused only on AT functional automation, which is penetrating the middle and top eight segment with strong growing projections. In the next five years, Aura plans to achieve wholesale revenue of 105 million euros, which represents 0.41% of the target market with a corresponding 45,000 units. In recent time, Aura has successfully completed developed, manufactured and sold a 90 centimeter double oven stove, which has proved to be popular with consumers. Has experienced and has been successful in obtaining grant from the Australian and European governments. Has invested millions in Europe in R&D activity. Has made market research to identify and quantify the target market and consumers. Has contacted and has received supported response by appliance distributor and in particular prestigious retailer like Winnings in Australia and John Lewis in UK. Aura multiple sales channel strategies aim to avoid any potential concentration of sales through limited type or the number of sales channel operators. Aura plans to invest 2.4 million euros in pre-commercialization activity. The go-to market will involve five milestones. The first one will be to register the patent application to protect the company AP. The second one will be to fund inventory and setting up or marketing a sales structure. The third one would be to start all marketing and sales activity, including 
got a launch, establish sales channel, get sales order. The fourth one would be to start preliminary e-commercialization activity. The fifth one would be to start commercialization. Or I will set up a group of companies strategically located in Netherlands, UK, Italy, and Australia. This structure has been conceived to maximize the following. Tax benefit, government grant opportunity in Europe and Australia that offer potential opportunity for 3 million euros of grants, Italy, high quality components and suppliers, product distribution location, and product market made in Italy. Auto founders have accumulated 30 years of experience in all aspects of the appliance industry, covering from product development, production, sales, marketing, and distribution. The company is currently seeking 3.7 million euros in new funds for 25% equity in the company, with a projected ROI of 664% maturing end of 2027. Options are a flexible exit, minimum three years from the date of investment, or negotiable conver convertible bonds. The new, cap uh, new capital and grants totaling 6.7 million euros would be fa to finance manufacturing, marketing, sales, and contingency cash funds. Furthermore, Aura has the innovative prerequisite for, to qualify for ASIC, early stage innovation company, which represents 20% incentives for Australian investors. Aura will start trading probably 12 months from the date of the new investment funding. Thank you for your attention. Best regard. The venture capital market is notorious for its illiquidity. Unlike that of public markets, investors don't have that power to buy and sell with speed and transparency. As an investor with existing equity in a company, this means, one, it's harder to restructure and rebalance your portfolio as you would in public markets, and two, it's near impossible to liquidate equity ahead of the business's intended exit. Essentially, your cash is stuck in stocks. On the other side of the coin, there are investors who are looking to enter later stage opportunities. However, those opportunities have already closed their doors to funding rounds. And if they do reopen, they're usually reserved for venture capital firms, existing investors, or private equity firms. This means there is a high and expensive barrier to entry. So with both these problems in mind, we have worked to launch the WI Capital's secondaries platform utilizing our network of 30,000 plus high net worth of sophisticated investors and combining that with the CRISP software, an underlying technology that helps streamline and facilitate these transactions. And it's already working. We are open for business and our clients are well underway in establishing their own secondaries markets. So if you're looking for options to sell existing equity in a company, or you want to see our most recent catalog of secondary investment opportunities, Feel free to contact us via the email on screen or reach out to us via the Brella booth for the remainder of the VNC conference. Well, hello, it's Yasser El Ansari here, the Chief Executive at the Australian Investment Council. Um, it's an absolute pleasure for me to be with you at Wholesale Investors Venture and Capital event this year. We're doing it virtually, of course, as uh, most events are today, um, but it's uh, a really important opportunity for us to have a discussion, to have a dialogue about the state of venture capital investment and the early stage investment ecosystem here in Australia right now. Many of you will know the Australian Investment Council um, has had a long history in the venture ecosystem, as well as the private equity and growth capital ecosystem. Um, our old identity was AVCAL, the Australian Private Equity and Venture Capital Association. A couple of years ago, we changed our identity to recognise the evolution and the change that's taking place within private capital investment, not just here in Australia, but indeed right around the world. Today, venture and early stage investment is in a really strong position in this market. It continues to accelerate and go from strength to strength, which I think is tremendously exciting. COVID-19 has, of course, forced every investor and indeed every business owner and founder 
to risk assess the way they operate, to think carefully about the way they do business. How can we manage the downsides to the greatest extent possible? And indeed, how do we capitalise on the upside opportunities created by this global pandemic? The public health crisis arising from the pandemic is very challenging and, of course, has been really saddening for us to see. Loss of life, uh, the people whose lives have been impacted in a really significant and profound way is, of course, very sad and disappointing to see. On the business side, the role of innovation coming out of this pandemic has never been more important. If you think about our day-to-day -day life and the way that innovation has suddenly become more relevant to each and every one of us, you'll appreciate the reasons why. Everyone now right across the community better understands the importance of technology in order to allow us all to continue to get on with our life as best as we possibly can. And what that means for investors is that the access uh, to global innovation through this particular asset class, the venture, uh, the venture capital investment asset class, is particularly strong. And we see that here in the Australian market and indeed right around the world. In 2020, to give you an illustration of this, we saw more than US $300 billion worth of capital invested through venture all over the world. That's remarkable when you think about the scale and volume of capital that that represents. And if you're interested, that $300 billion milestone was second only to 2018, where the record was set um, for the highest level um, in history at around about US $330 billion in deployed capital through venture. What's really interesting about this is that Asia is becoming a more significant driver of that capital being deployed into venture um, in a global context. And I think that's really interesting. We know that economically there is a power shift underway uh, where Asia um, is competing for its share of the global economy as against traditional established markets in North America and indeed in Europe. But in a venture context, this hasn't always been the case, certainly not up until recently at least. But now we are seeing some of the world's biggest venture deals being closed in key markets across Asia and within China in particular. And that marks, I think, a very significant step change from where we've been over the recent past. Here in Australia, closer to home, in 2020, we saw aggregate new capital raised of around about $1.3 billion, which is the highest ever on record in our local market. That's something we're really proud of. That fundraising is really being driven by large commitments from institutional level investors, such as superannuation funds and sovereign wealth funds. And that in itself signals something really important. It signals their desire and their hunger to access the innovation ecosystem. And it marks, I think, a significant step change from where we've been over the past decade. When you have large institutional investors like our superannuation funds making significant commitments of capital into strategies like venture, I think it's something we should all sit up and take notice of. It means that they're seeing the profound impact of innovation in our economy, not just today, but into the future. For institutional and indeed for wholesale investors, venture continues to present a really compelling investment strategy. You all know that. That's why you're a part of this event, of course. But if you needed that reassurance, I can give it to you. The pipeline of investment opportunities for skilled fund managers continues to be exceptionally strong here in Australia. There's certainly no risk that the capital uh, being allocated into venture will exhaust great quality deal opportunities anytime soon. The returns that we're seeing through well-designed venture investment programs is also exceptionally strong. But as with any investment strategy, it's vitally important that you continue to do your diligence well to ensure that you're selecting managers who can deliver the best and most sustainable and repeatable investment performance that you want from investing into venture. We have a tremendously strong ecosystem of venture managers here in Australia, and it's becoming stronger and stronger every day. I know, in fact, that you're going to be hearing from some of our best and brightest throughout this wholesale investor event over the next few days. <clears throat> For founders and entrepreneurs who are looking to access investment capital, everything I just spoke about is as equally important to you as well. There is a significant lift in the volume of capital looking to be deployed into exceptionally exceptional and great startup businesses all over the economy. 
The sectors that continue to attract significant volumes of investment capital include ICT and digital technology, of course. FinTech in particular is really grabbing a significant share of that investment capital being deployed into ICT and digital. Software as a service businesses are attracting large amounts of capital, as are businesses in the payment technology area. You only need to look at the significant change that's played out for businesses such as Afterpay and other market competitors who are seeking to follow in Afterpay's big footsteps. Consumer discretionary facing businesses are also continuing to do really well, despite what you might think on the surface that bricks and mortar retail is declining. Online consumer discretionary retail um, is accelerating and doing really, really well is propelled by the accelerated shift that we've seen towards online retail as a result of the pandemic. Some of the sectors to watch out for over the period ahead include areas such as ag tech, areas such as employment and HR technology businesses, and indeed reg tech businesses. All of these sectors have attracted what I would describe as modest levels of capital over the recent years, but I absolutely expect that to change in the period ahead as we rebound out of the economic downturn not th- that, that we've experienced here in Australia and indeed most developed economies have experienced around the world. When it comes to the investment capital that's being deployed through venture funds here in the Australian market, we have seen over the past 12 months, Series A funding rounds decrease slightly. That's a function really of the fact that venture funds are raising larger amounts of capital and therefore they need to make more meaningful and larger commitments to the investments that they make through their larger funds. But that's not something to be concerned about. That growth in the more mature and established end of the market is creating big opportunities for smaller VC funds. Some refer to them as micro VC funds to establish and take a foothold in the innovation ecosystem. They're really stepping in and growing the base of capital that's available to be invested at both seed and Series A stage. And that's something that will be key, that, that will become great news for entrepreneurs right across our market. It's a fantastic time to be engaged in the innovation ecosystem here in Australia. Whether you're an investor looking to support the next homegrown Australian startup that will go on to become a best-in-class leader in a particular sector, or indeed, whether you're an entrepreneur with a pocket full of ideas in the world at your fingertips, it's a really exciting time. The thing that makes all of that worthwhile beyond the dollars, beyond the returns and beyond the accolades is the very real difference that innovation is making to our life every single day. In fact, later today, I challenge you to do this. When you have a moment with your thoughts, think about how innovation and technology has fundamentally transformed every single thing you do throughout the day. From the moment you wake up to your last moment awake for that day, you'll be amazed at the role of innovation when you add all of that up. All of that is only possible through the commitment of investors and the amazing entrepreneurs who dream up those crazy ideas that we never thought of. Where would we be today if we didn't have the combination of both? Enjoy the rest of this wholesale investor event. The work that Steve and his team do is so important, and I know that you will all enjoy every moment of this online event over the next few days. I'm so pleased to have been able to play just a small part of it. I hope you've enjoyed this session. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joyce. I'm the chief of Javis. Javis is just a very intelligent system. We are an emerging tech retailing startup with vision to transform the way we live, work, and play. Our mission is to accelerate the adoption of intelligent ecosystem for consumers, businesses in the most fun and engaging ways. Today, I'm so excited to share with you that we are building the world's first automated bubble tea ecosystem, Jupiter. A little background on bubble tea market. Bubble tea first appeared in the early 80s in Taiwan. It is a dessert, a two-in-one snack and drink. A typical bubble tea order will include tea, milk, flavor, topping, brown sugar. Perhaps it is this wide variety of choices which makes it so addictive. 
In 2017, the New York Times featured an article about bubble tea becoming mainstream. It is about 10 billion in market shares and projected to continue its explosive growth. At first glance, the current bubble tea market appears crowded and competitive, but we see it differently. We see opportunity in the underserved market where there are huge demands but insufficient supplies. There are issues associated with traditional bubble tea stores, such as long queue, labor shortage, high staff turnover, inconsistent product quality, and expensive retail space. But we can disrupt and transform this by fully automating the production of freshly brewed tea. With the use of emerging tech, it enables pre-ordering, 24-7 operations, consistent quality and taste. We are able to further string the operation of a traditional bubble tea store from a 400 square feet to about 32 square feet, which is about 2 by 1.5 meters and without frontline staff. This allows us to scale to thousands of locations globally with mass production. We envision a world with thousands of Jupiter cars in every street corner serving bubble tea around the clock. We bring quality, convenience, entertainment to bubble tea fans around the world. Jupiter has advanced robotic system and smart tea brewing and dispensing machine. You can order through mobile app, pay via our wallet. It is a perfect solution for current pandemic environment as it is fully contactless. We have predictive fulfillment capabilities to lower and manage fulfillment costs. For targeted advertising and marketing, there are transparent screens to show data-driven content. Gamification on mobile app will engage our fans for interactive experience and social engagement. Our unique economics is amazing. By selling 300 cups per day with operating profit of 33%, we can achieve a payback period of seven months. To break even, we only need 120 cups per day. With strong operating cash flow, we will be able to finance 80% of the cost of each Jupiter card. This will make our business capex light. Our edge is that we know how to build our own proprietary technology at a cost and production rate, which will enable us to scale profitably. On top of that, we strive to be one of the leading bubble tea brands in each of these countries to make bubble tea pervasive. Our card can produce up to 600 cups of bubble tea before the next replenishment cycle and is able to generate more than 350 permutations for customers to choose from. As a bubble tea fan for more than 20 years myself, I do not compromise on the quality of my dream. I take it upon myself to ensure all our customers enjoy our product. It is our goal to be one of the leading bubble tea brands by redefining the bubble tea competitive landscape with technologies. Our key differentiator is that we are producing freshly made drinks without any human intervention. Our target customer segment is Gen X to Gen Z, which is about 45% of the world population or loosely translated to 3.6 billion people in this category. We can reach out to them through transport hub, workplaces, malls, schools, and even hospitals. Our platform has a multi-sided offering, the bubble tea, digital out-of-home advertising, gamification, just the bubble tea alone, we are making an average profit of $2.80 per cup. Based on a top-down approach market report conducted, the bubble tea market is about $10 billion in 2019, and China being the fastest growing market while US is one of the largest. As we are creating new market through automation, we will expect the current market to grow. Based on bottom-up approach, the Singapore market size is about 400 million per year. But what is interesting is the potential market size for Singapore is actually 2 billion per year. Since our market segment is 45% of world population, now imagine if each of them drink one cup of bubble tea per month, the potential global market size is about 200 billion per year. Now, do you see what we see? The opportunity to serve this potential market with the use of emerging tech. Been very fortunate to secure two notable partnerships since we started in January this year. Our office is located at Technology Development Center in ITE Central. Our first car will most likely be here as well, where there are 10,000 students. We are also working closely with China Singapore Suzhou Industrial Park. They are a government to government organization. Through them, we can gain access to connections and capital in China. Our second car will likely to be within CSSD Singapore co working space. We have an experienced team with in-depth knowledge of emerging tech, digital transformation, retail, international market, operations, and engineering. 
We are currently a 10 man team and we are still expanding. By the end, by the end of the year, our team will be more than 20 strong. We have just concluded our 500,000 pre seed round at 10 million valuation cap and we are now seeking 2 million in the upcoming seed round. Structure will be saved at valuation cap of 25 million. The funds will be deployed to create value and deliver our key milestones. A large part of it is really focusing on the product development, producing MVP and pre-production units. We are in the midst of registering our patents and the remaining funds will be for corporate development. The key milestone of how we begin, where we are now and our exciting journey ahead. JVS was incorporated in January this year. We have completed the design of our MVP and has closed a pre-seed round of 500,000 and 10 million valuation cap. The next milestones for us is really to build the MVP, test marketing in Singapore, and concurrently raise 2 million in the upcoming seed round. This will put us in a good position to raise 25 million Series A early next year, to build mass production facility to scale up to 11 countries. This will also propel us to 1,000 Jupiter cars by January 23 with revenue run rate of 350 million. We target public listing in June 2024 and reach 9,000 cars and revenue of 1.7 billion by 2025. All in all, we see opportunities in this underserved market. We have an experienced team who knows how to execute the plan to mass produce to scale globally. We have clear path to profitability. We can build a great business which will last for generations to come. Thank you for watching. My name is Joyce, the Chief of JVIS. Looking forward to discuss with you about our future collaboration at JVIS. Bye-bye. Hi, my name is Ming Ling, founder of Likuru. Today, I would like to tell you a little bit about our company. Likuru is an online marketplace that specializes in alcohol delivery. It is also a liquor distribution platform that supports our merchants. Likuru creates this end-to-end -end ecosystem where customers and merchants both benefit. We created Likaroo to solve problems for both consumers and merchants. For consumers, there's lack of on-demand delivery service for alcohol products and inconvenience for customers purchasing liquors in store. For merchants, liquor, uh, liquor stores are expensive and time consuming to set up and operate. And logistics are also slow and costly in Australia. Our solution for customers is creating a marketplace where they can get their alcohol delivered on demand until late. Most of our deliveries are completed in third, less than 30 minutes. This allows our customers to save time and money as they don't have to drive out, find parking, browse in store, waiting in line just to get their drinks. It could save lives by reduced drink driving. Gathering and parties don't need to stop because of short supply of drinks. We created the platform for our merchants to source products at a competitive price and sell those products to customers on Liquor Marketplace, allowing merchants to save time, save money, and make money. Our merchants are strategically located to provide the best coverage and service to our customers. So how do we do it? Likaru operates a hybrid model by recruiting franchisees and partnering with existing liquor stores in different regions. This allows fast expansion with little upfront capital requirements for Likaru, its franchisees and partners. We operate an asset light business model by creating a mutually beneficial ecosystem with manufacturers, our retail partners, and consumers. So what does the market look like for Likaroo? In Australia, 
the total liquor industry market size is $35 billion, and online liquor sales only accounted for 6% of the total in 2020, pre-COVID-19. At the same time, the growth rate of online sales is more than twice the overall market growth. COVID-19 has changed a lot of things. It has changed people's shopping behavior and accelerated the shift towards online shopping. As we can see from the graph below by Australian Post, the growth peaked in April 2020, but then stabled at more than three times growth compared to Christmas busy period in 2019. Likaru experienced 400% revenue growth compared to same period in 2019. So why do franchises choose Likaru? Let's take a look at how much effort and investment is required to set up a liquor store. It takes more than seven months to apply for a license, do training, find a shop, renovate, find suppliers, and stock up. The initial investment for just a small bottle shop is more than $300,000. There's also expensive ongoing costs to consider. When we put the two models side by side, you can see why Likuru is a much safer bet and much more scalable. The initial cost can be as little as $9,000 compared to minimum 300K. And it only takes five days for a liquor store to be set up compared to a seven months period. Ongoing cost is also a fraction of liquor stores. With little capital investment, liquor is already covering most of the major Australian cities. There are quite a few conventional and online retailers in Australia. Likaru, however, is different from the pack in its ability to quickly scale and top-notch delivery service. Below are some of our competitive advantages. Our memorable brand, we are scalable. Our logistic, which is the ability to deliver within 30 minutes and national distribution for our merchants. Our innovation to stay ahead of the trend, we are data-driven and our supportive partners. Here are some of our partners and some user feedbacks. We have ex achieved exponential growth in the past three years that we have been in business and forecast growth to $10 million revenue in 2022 with the C funding investment. We are looking to raise $1 million to achieve $10 million revenue in 12 months. Below is an overall breakdown of where the funding is going to be spent on. We aim to complete the seed round by end of 2021, achieve 10 million revenue by end of 2022, and IPO in ASX in around 2025. Our, leader, our leadership team consists of myself, Eric, Ian, and Ashley. I graduated as an aerospace engineer, have five year experience in FMCG industry, and more than 10 years of experience in leading complex engineering projects, most of which require dealing with government and regulatory bodies. Eric is our co-founder and COO. He founded the, the Adelaide BBS, the most influential online community forum in Adelaide. Eric had involvement in a few startups as a key member and had five years of experience in running a chain of food and grocery stores. Ian, our nine exec director, is also our first investor. He was the founder and CEO of CLCOA, leading teams of more than 250 people and with assets under management of up to half a, half a billion. Ashley, our CFO, 
has over 10 years commercial and financial experience. She is an ex Deloitte corporate development manager of a large scale acquisition and capital raise. Ashley has formed connection with industry leaders through her advisory experience. Some of Likaru's investment highlights, just to recap, we have market size of 35 billion in Australia alone. Likaru achieved an average year over year revenue growth of 300%. Scalable and asset light business model, 300K investment received so far for this run. Disruptive tech solution for liquor industry, for liquor industry. And lastly, I would like to quickly mention our R&D project, alcohol vending machine. This project is matched with 42% rebate from Australian government. We are working with universities, industry lead designers, vending machine manufacturers to create an automatic vending machine with integration of age verification and inter intoxication detection systems. The end product would be a product that will be fully compliant with liquor regulation and fit into our ecosystem nicely. Thank you. I hope you enjoy our quick intro and please reach out to us if you have any questions or wish to discuss further about this opportunity. My name is Ryan Reevely. I am the founder and CEO of Smart Visit. Today, I'll be introducing you to our company and presenting the opportunity to participate in our Series A capital raising. Smart Visit makes it easy for you and I to get the most of the time we spend exploring destinations. We all want to have great experiences. This not only includes what we do and see, but also the experience we go through in getting to what we want. We provide a platform that digitizes, streamlines, and packages travel-related experiences for the travel industry and for loyalty program operators. We've been in operation since, since 2010, operating across the globe in 17 major tourism destinations, working with the leading operators of tours, activities, and attractions, some of which, like the Acropolis, are truly iconic and world-renowned. Our clients are leaders within the markets they serve or are responsible on a global level for promoting tourism for a particular destination. Dubai Tourism, for example, is a government body who utilizes us to manage the official city attraction pass for Dubai. For event hotels and resorts, we manage their priority guest rewards loyalty program. Businesses such as Kluk, Expedia, and Get Your Guide who focus on promoting and selling travel experiences, white label our city attraction pass products and resell digital attraction and tour tickets we supply. So now let's get into the heart of what we do and what we offer. At the core of our business is the Smart Visit platform. It's the middleware, the payment platform that sits between our clients and tour and attraction partners. We connect at one end to booking reservation and loyalty program management systems, and on the other to ticketing and gate control systems used by tour and attraction operators. This provides us the ability to manage complex, non-standardized transactions, whereby points, passes, and tickets can be redeemed seamlessly around the world for experiences. A key issue, which most of us will be familiar with, is the challenges associated with exploring a new destination. We're often confronted with long lines, dealing with customer service people, keeping track of tickets and vouchers, and getting less than the best value for what we pay. These issues impact negatively on our travel experience, often resulting in us doing and spending less 
and at times even missing out on what the destination has to offer. This, of course, being a major concern to organizations dedicated to promoting and selling tours and activities. What we've set out to do is eliminate most of these pain points by streamlining, digitizing, and packaging tours and activities, a core component of which is providing a mechanism by which our clients can design, distribute, and operate their own pass products. Attraction or city passes, as they are often referred to, offer a selection of tours and activities within a single product, providing easy, straight to the gate access to a wide range of experiences over a set period of time, along with the benefits of savings, convenience, and flexibility. Due to the inherent value these products provide, they have become extremely popular with tourists, and importantly for us, a key tool used by our clients and pro in promoting and selling activities. Taking the same general approach we have taken to resolving the key issues for tourists, we can address one of the major issues facing loyalty program operators in terms of how they can increase engagement with their members. In an environment where loyalty programs are under increasing pressure to gain the attention of consumers, consumers are being more selective than ever in what programs they engage with. What has been clearly identified is what consumers are looking for. They want access to a wider range of rewards. They want access to experiences. They want to be able to access rewards immediately offline at the venue. As a way of example and how this is translating into the real world, Qantas Frequent Flyer, Australia's largest loyalty program, recently partners with Hoyt Cinemas to allow their members to redeem points directly at the cinema. We're addressing this simply. We're offering a huge catalog of experiences which can be redeemed directly at the venue simply by presenting a loyalty card and paying with points. I'll take this opportunity to focus on three of our core, more technical capabilities. First, the ongoing management and development of the Smart Visit platform a platform which has been evolving for over 10 years and which today manages thousands of types of different points, passes, or tickets issued by our clients. What makes this platform unique? Its ability to manage each point, ticket, or pass based on a set of business rules as set by our clients, which dictates how, when, and where each can be redeemed and by providing all the reporting and invoicing tools required to facilitate the cross-border flow of funds between our clients and suppliers. Second, we have built an inevitable global network of businesses who are all connected digitally to our system. Through API connections or other software applications, we connect to both proprietary and most major off-the-shelf booking, reservation, ticketing and gate control systems. Finally, worth noting is the value we offer in terms of how we collect, manage and use data. Data we obtain specifically through customer profile and use of inf usage information we collect. First, we provide the tools to enable our clients to use data to engage with their customers in a timely and targeted manner. And as importantly, analyze data sets we gather globally to develop and price pass and other products to ensure their consumer and commercial viability. We present what we do along three product lines. iVentureCart, our digital ticketing and city attraction pass business line is used by our clients, co-branding with them to designate these products. For instance, the city attractions pass issued by Dubai Tourism is, for example, the official Dubai Pass powered by iVentureCard. Play with Points is our loyalty rewards business, which provides a catalog of experiences that can be redeemed in market, offline, at the venue for points. And finally, Smart Visit Solutions is our program management outsourcing business that supports predominantly loyalty and gift card programs. In 2019, the business generated over 17 million of revenue, 
Revenues are earned through a combination of one-off fees charged when we establish a new program, transaction fees charged when a pass or ticket or membership is issued, or when a pass ticket or point is redeemed at a merchant venue. We also generate significant revenues from resale activities, most of which involves the resale of pass products through our iVentureCard.com website. We are a successful business. Over the past five years, we have experienced strong revenue growth with little outside capital investment. We not only expanded our global reach between 2015 and 2019, but increased our business in existing destinations we operated in. The COVID-19 period has obviously had a major impact on our business. Nevertheless, we have achieved a lot during this period. We have streamlined our operations to be even more efficient and focused our attention on key clients and operations, all while keeping a strong eye on the bottom line. As a result, we remained profitable over the past 12 months and have not only retained all our key clients, but have secured new ones that has led to recent launches of new products in Dubai and Rome. While the picture remains somewhat uncertain, travel is certainly picking up. Over the northern summer period, we have seen a clear increase in activity in both Athens and Dubai. And while the current picture in Australia is quiet, our clients here are investing as they prepare for what they see as a strong recovery in domestic travel at the end of this year and for international travel by the middle of 2022. Overall, it might take longer that many industry pundits suggest for travel to recover. However, we believe we're in a strong position to not only rebuild our business to pre-COVID levels on less global travel activity, but actually to get back on a high growth trajectory from what we had achieved in 2019 within a short to medium term period. The bottom line is this, we are an established business with a proven capability to execute for our clients. We have unique capabilities to deliver complete end-to-end -end solutions, connecting our clients with experiences. We have a diversified revenue and client base, which has served us well, especially over the past year or so. And finally, we will continue to leverage our technical capabilities and current global footprint to drive our business forward profitably, expanding into new destinations with low capital investment. We are seeking to raise $1 million through the issue of Series A preference shares. These funds will be used to strengthen our operations to meet re-emerging demand for our products and services. We've aggressively priced the issue at a 4 million pre-money valuation to take into account that travel is still recovering. The preference shares we are offering are fully participating, paying a minimum 8% annual dividend. We've already secured half the money we are raising. So now we're looking to fill the rest of the round through commitments of another half million dollars. For comparative point purposes, we would point to the ASX listed company JRide, which provides an online airport transfer booking platform. The company has a market cap of around 37 million and raised over time approximately 32 million in debt and equity. Without taking anything away from them, Comparing their performance with ours, it's noteworthy that SmartVisit has achieved higher revenues, similar growth rates, and operating profits rather than losses since 2016. Looking forward, we intend to either list or seek a strategic buyer investor for the company in the next three to four years, with the aim to deliver a significant return for our current shareholders and new investors. I'd like to take this opportunity now to thank you for your time, and I look forward to having you on board. Good morning and thank you for joining this presentation for DJ. I am Jung Soo Woo, 
Director of Strategy and Operation at BJET Air. So what is BJET? BJET is an on-demand and door-to-door -door air travel solution that will be available on your mobile as if you're using Grab or Uber. Our goal is to serve our millions of customers to enjoy faster, easier, and safer travel experience when they fly in Southeast Asia with the most practical private jet. So what are we solving? So the travel burnout that you have to travel short for your critical business meeting and lunch or dinner, but when you realize that you had wasted much of your time on the ground, then in the air. This is not new to all of us. So the travel burnout is really the key problem that we're solving with DJET. So let's rewind the clock back to pre-COVID and see what was the key issue here. Southeast Asia is the busiest air travel market in the world. Not to mention all those statistics, this is the largest air travel market in the world with millions, billions of you know, uh, passengers per year traveling across the region. And there is an efficient infrastructure access or capacity of the airport. So you have to uh, expect delays and wait, and again, changes of your schedule while you're traveling in Southeast Asia. But all the legacy solutions in this region is coming all with a bus mindset. That's how we call it. It's all bus. Because if you take on the first class, you're still on a bus with many others. You can't avoid any delays or any ways. You just have to. And there's another solution in this region, the private jet. But even that, you're just chartering your own limo bus. It is super expensive more than 10,000 US dollars per hour, which is more than 15 times of your first class fare. And there is only 80 plus minus jets in this region available for commercial operation. It's just super difficult to find one in the right timing. And COVID-19 is making it even worse. You have to wait longer and you have to get on the board, you know, with more anxiety, you know, sitting with you know, strangers. And all those perks like champagne, they're all gone. So the value in the premium cabin is diminishing even further. And here comes our solution, DJET, the new way of air travel in Southeast Asia. There are five key elements that I want to highlight. First, we'll be using light jet, the most efficient light jet for eight or less passengers, Embraer Phenom 300. And we'll be focusing for those to fly short in Southeast Asia or elsewhere within four hour distance. This is the travel route where we believe with the maximum pain points we, did, that we just discussed. And it will be affordable. It will be cost effective than any premium cabin or legacy private jet. And it will be quick. It is a door to door service with dedicated processing and there will be no delay or wait. And it's a simple. Within 24 hours notice, on your mobile, with real-time support, you can find BZET. So here comes our cabin. The comp reason at a glance. 
VJet, if we take Singapore to Jakarta one way, one hour, 45 minutes route as an example, the price for VJ is US dollar 1,600. It is just a little more than the first class fare from the Singapore Air, and it's much cheaper than those legacy private jet in this region, as you can see on the right. And it's faster enough and faster as the private jet in this region, just a little more than three hours will get you to your final destination. And it will be shared you know, within those of our eight theater cabin. And also private cabin is available at preferential pricing. This is how it's gonna work, be that on your mobile. So simply become a buy member, our member, then you can find DJ just simply telling us where to go and by when. Then we'll find your DJ. And you can choose whether to travel in private or share the cabin. Then review your travel plan with DJ and then confirm. Then uh, the time of departure that will be there and pick you up at your door. This is how it's gonna be available uh, on your mobile. So on top of our own platform, there are three secret sources uh, that is you know, making the building block for our differentiation. The first is LightJet, the Singular Phenom 300. This is the most practical and cost efficient light jet in the world. And also we're building our in-house MRO and FBO capabilities for our own place, which then enabling us a higher utilization of the fleet with better control control. And also we will having our own hangar at Salita Airport in Singapore. This is for us to avoid any excessive fixed operating cost for landing or departing. So the operating cost comparison by having those three key elements of our operation. When large jet in this region in legacy jet model, it can only be justified more than 10,000 US dollar per flight hour. Our operating cost of these apps, all included, is nearly half of it. And this is all because of our in-house capabilities that enabling higher utilization of our fleet and because we can use our own platform getting rid of any brokerage markup on top. Our target customers are three groups. First of all, corporate travelers who need to travel for any critical in-person client meetings or the business meeting. We'll be able to make a day travel for any critical client meeting or the lunch. And the second group is the fluent individuals, so those who want more private or faster or you know, safer experience for their, themselves or their families. And also we'll be working with the premium partners who wants to treat their clients in more premium manner. We already talked with some of the prospective customers of ours and we're getting a, a, a positive feedback. Uh, the one thing that I want to highlight here is they'll look at this cost of travel, not just from the flight cost perspective. It's the total cost of travel. And if you can save a night in your travel and more extra meals in your travel, that's how our corporate customers are comparing the DZ to their current options. So we see the potential of this market up to more than 1.5 million passengers per year. There are 30 million passengers traveling in first or business class in and out of the Southeast Asia. And among those, seven plus millions are only traveling within this region. And we think those who's with more than 1 million investable assets, that is 1.5 plus million population in this region, is affordable our DJ. This market in Southeast Asia is a really fragmented and premature stage. There are six on two, oh, sorry, 264 division sets available in this region, of which only 80 are available for commercial operation, and top three operators only controlling 16 of those. And 88% of the passengers who's using legacy private jet in this time, they're only flying less than four hours. So even the current competitive landscape in this region is very fragmented, but there is a signs of new normal flying short within Southeast Asia. 
And there are other early signs of new normal we see. The travel pattern of people are changing. They're concerning flexibility, security, and safety and seating already. And there are people already looking for alternatives. One interesting fact is last year in Singapore, there are a lot of people looking for private jet travel, but because of the cost, they're often organizing crowdfunding among themselves to split the cost. So if you look at the DJS pricing model and the way it works, there is already all these signs of the new normal that is favoring the DJS business model. The DJS Air Private Limited is already established and preparing this business for the last 24 months. And there has been a lot of you know, significant progress we've made, starting from the fleet operating partnership with Eagle Aviation, that is coming with the you know, P4 Part 135 AOC, the Air Operator Certificate. We are already undergoing the aircraft purchase discussion and direct engagement with Embraer, the manufacturer. And there is also a LOI submitted to purchase a spacious hangar at Salita Airport. So that being said, our commencement date is 12 months ahead, third quarter 2022. And we will be putting together a critical operating components of ourselves. And also we'll be working on our go-to-market plan and sales and marketing as well towards our commencement date. The financial forecast of DJS. So the revenue target that we're looking at is a US million, US dollar, 100 million and plus in first four years. And by then we'll be passing BP flight hours in year three or year four. And our seven years target is US dollar 650 years million and plus by becoming a 100 plus small and medium sized fleet specialist across Southeast Asia and also expanding to Northeast Asia, connecting China, Korea, and Japan. Our team is with two co-founders coming into really in a challenge mindset to this legacy uh, private jet industry in Southeast Asia. And our advisory team is all coming with long experiences from private aviation, Embraer, the manufacturer itself, and also the longest private aviation company here in Singapore, Global Aviation. And I'm proud of our partners, including Embraer, our OEM manufacturer, who's supporting us from MRO to the fleet acquisition and also the hangar acquisition here in Singapore, and other notable partners who's coming in with a long and proven track record in private aviation here in Southeast Asia. So the ad, we're raising 25 million US dollars in the seat rising. And that is for us to support our fleet acquisition, hangar acquisition, and fixed operating and overhead costs and product development and marketing costs for the next 30 months. So quick summary to close my presentation for DZ. 25 million US dollars seat raising. You are investing in the new way of air travel in Southeast Asia. And this is the largest air travel in the market with the premature and fragmented private aviation. And we'll be the first mover serving the new normal from next year with unbeatably low pricing and unique customer experiences. And there is 12 months to launch and we're working with our OEMs and industry partners. 100 million US dollar plus revenue in four years passing the BEP, and we're looking at 650 million US dollar revenue in seven years. Last but not least, our investors share much of the profile with our customers. So if you think this is the new way of travel for yourself in the next years, then this is the investment opportunity for you. Thank you.
Hello, Neil Graham's my name. I'm Global Ambassador for Long Pipes. We make this, a fluid highway and a hydrogen highway, which is at the moment transporting water, and we expect shortly to be transporting hydrogen in vast volumes for the new hydrogen economy as it comes online. We're looking for enabling partners to work with for investment and technology to create a future hydrogen economy. Look forward to talking with you at the Wholesale Investor Meeting. I'm Steve Andriezza, CEO of Long Pipes. The world is changing, and collectively we need rapid transformation in our energy sector just to maintain the way of life we lead today. Long Pipes is an enabling component of that clean energy transformation. We offer safe, responsible, and sustainable solutions that create real long term value. We're talking to customers that need thousands of kilometres of pipelines for clean energy projects over the next three to five years, it's worth billions of dollars. We're looking for partners to help us scale into those opportunities and to change the world's energy markets. I look forward to talking to you at Wholesale Investor. Thank you. My name is Annie Stein, I'm CEO of the Date. Um, just a bit of background, I've been in the infrastructure development environment for 30 years, mostly in complex infrastructure, power generation, and worked across Africa, uh, Middle East, Australia, and New Zealand. Hi, I'm Christian Strauss. I'm the COO of Adet Energy. I have 20 plus years of experience in the in energy infrastructure space, uh, and also subsequently civil infrastructure space as well. 
What is the problem that we're facing in terms of the Australian electricity grid? Um, if you look at the current markets, um, everything is centralized. Uh, it's very traditional and it's fixed. Uh, whereas we're moving towards decentralized, renewable and flexible. The problem we're facing is grid instability, grid congestion, volatile markets, and obviously physical limitations. But there are solutions in terms of smart grid, intelligent markets, and we are looking towards flexibility. When you look at where we've come from, large coal fire generation that sends power one way to major capital cities through a transmission network that is basically one directional to focus on uh, sending power to end consumers in cities. What we're looking at in the future on the right hand side is the a diversification of that. Uh, renewables will be located in many spots around the country, uh, need to be connected through a diverse smart energy network that's bi-directional and can send energy to existing and new consumers of the future. So what are the challenges we're looking at? Um, existing infrastructure is not renewable ready. There are limitations in terms of the transmission networks. Um, there are significant delays and curtailment happening in those networks. Then there are the issue of regulatory red type uh, in terms of um, becoming a regulated asset. Uh, the vulnerability of the network is a further aspect that needs to be considered because the network has got no backup and it's not connected to something else. And getting connections is a, uh, it's a very highly complicated and expensive exercise going forward. So what's our value proposition? Uh, our value proposition is connecting the best renewable energy sources from around the country. As you can see on our map there, that mainly they are located outside the existing network, which, which hugs the co eastern coastline of Australia. So Central Australia, the Great Australian Bight, Western Australia, and the Northern Territory. Connecting those and sending diversified renewable energy from across the country will help assist in the accelerated acceleration take up of renewable energy and the phase out of coal. So I would um, a debt assist in resolving this. Um, Obviously, looking at the current energy demand, you need um, to transport the energy from uh, point A to point B. You need to look at the grid stability issues, and you need to find a way to actually deal with the trading of renewable energy capacity. Also, a date would be looking at the federal um, budget setting aside for potential investment um, in the renewable side. Uh, further to that, also look at the uh, enablement of renewable energy from across the country enhance uh, long-term um, profitability of operations. In other words, um, changing the issue of um, curtailment and very importantly to um, support the enhancement of hydrogen, wind and solar portfolios going forward. So what's the solution and what will it bring about? Well, the solution is high voltage direct current transmission. It's much more efficient, it's cheaper, it eliminates curtailment and marginal loss factors for new uh, for renewable energy generators. It's an expansion of the existing network and actually helps uh, in assisting the existing network in, in becoming stronger and more effective in its energy transmission. It'll unlock vast renewable energy zones and reduce the time for those renewable energy uh, providers to, to come to market. So what is the competition for a debt? Um, a debt, um, looking at the debt in, the, in its sense, it's fast, it's continent wide, it, it um, brings uh, significant benefits for Australia, it is private network or merchant network, whereas existing regulated transmission networks are slow, it's regional. Um, they obviously would protect the um, existing current installed base, and it's pretty inflexible in terms of that. Then you have private or oil and gas transmission and other distribution companies that are not really focused on renewable energies. They, they provide single connectors, and there's a particular conflict of interest. Most important of all of this is a debt would add value to all those networks and unlocking more transmission capacity. So why, why is the timing right now? Uh, well, the major risk to new uh, renewable energy providers is connection. Uh, getting a connection to the, into the network uh, takes time and money and uh, is, is very troublesome for the energy developers. Uh, with recent other developments such as bushfire and COVID, large institutional investors are now heavily pushing for a renewables -led economic recovery post COVID. So um, we've been in discussions as a debt with um, a number of strategic partners. Uh, on the OEM side, um, General Electric, Siemens and AVB are extremely supportive of, of the way forward in terms of the new network. On the financing side, we've been really working closely with ANC Bank, 
uh, having discussions with Macquarie and Deutsche Bank. On the regulator side, AMIA has clearly expressed um, their support for the project, and we've also been working closely with uh, Northern Territory. There are other players like CIP and QIC. Uh, there are technical players such as uh, TSK, um, ZTT, um, and then there are private equity firms. Private equity firms like to jump on, but they can only do that once we achieve financial investment decision. And then obviously the, there's a number of renewable energy developers that would like to become part of this as well. So what do what the figures look like from a, from a high level down? So from our concept level, network that we've developed and, and, and provide, done some study on. Uh, we're, uh, we're looking at 5,000 kilometers of transmission network with a capacity of about 10 gigawatts, uh, enabling about 20 to 30 uh, gigawatts worth of renewable energy development to go forward. Development funding, we're looking for 10 million the first year and 15 million for subsequent years, two to five to fund our operations, which will involve engineering design, stakeholder engagement for government regulatory issues uh, and dealing with uh, renewable energy developers. Going forward, post-financial close, um, final investment decision, we're, we're looking at, uh, in a base case scenario, a CapEx investment of $10.5 billion, an IRR of 12 to 15%, an MPV after tax of 5.2 billion and an EBITDA uh, in our base case of 1.8 billion. So uh, what's next for an investor? Um, you know, as Christian was saying, as we would be using the funds mostly to look at the feasibility, uh, continue the creation of intellectual property, uh, develop the uh, necessary algorithms around our energy arbitrage, um, look at the initial stage development activities and build our models. So uh, as said, our initial ask is 10 million for the investment. Um, we would be looking at further grant funding as well as we move forward. The step up for the uh, initial investors would be around six times over that um, set uh, period. Thank you. Um, we connect with us on um, the CRISP network. is Greg Perkins, the co-founder and CEO of Wildfire Energy. Our vision is to eliminate landfill by turning waste into renewable energy and hydrogen at distributed scale using our proprietary MIG technology. By 2050, global solid waste generation is forecast to reach 3.4 billion tonnes per annum and generate over 8% of global emissions. Simultaneously, there is a $500 billion per annum market emerging for green hydrogen. However, hydrogen production from fossil fuels has high emissions, and hydrogen production from renewables is currently three to five times too expensive. Our MIG technology provides a low-cost, low-emissions solution. Today, many waste materials end up in landfill. Tomorrow, we can achieve zero waste to landfill by using distributed waste to energy plants. These plants will produce hydrogen and renewable energy, with inerts being recycled into construction materials, and local carbon capture will be applied to further reduce emissions. Our solution is called MIG, Moving Injection Horizontal Gasification, a new process invented by wildfire. In the first step, waste is converted to syngas containing carbon monoxide and hydrogen in our patented MIG reactors. The raw syngas is cleaned using proven equipment, and finally, clean power and hydrogen are produced for sale. The core innovations of MIG include batch loading of the waste, eliminating complex pretreatment and feeding systems, integrated closed loop pre-drying to remove excess moisture using waste heat, patented moving injection process, which creates a localized high temperature zone that is slowly moved through the bed of feedstock, and removal of inert solidified slag in batches, eliminating complex ash removal systems. We've built a pilot plant in Australia and used it to prove the MIG concept by converting domestic and industrial waste into syngas. Our technology is being patented worldwide, with the Australian patent already granted. Conventional waste to energy plants are complex and expensive and only suited to large cities. 
Through modular design, we can reduce the costs through mass production and speed up project execution times. Conventional waste to energy using incineration is not able to produce high value products like hydrogen. Some companies are attempting to produce biofuels or adapt conventional gasification for small scale. However, the cost is too high. Only the MIG technology can deliver low cost waste to energy at small scale. The market opportunity is enormous. Global waste disposal costs exceed $250 billion per annum and represent over 100,000 projects. And hydrogen is emerging as a large market. Our research shows a service available market for MIG of $25 billion per annum or around 10,000 projects globally. By 2030, we aim to have seven of our own projects in operation and more than 15 licensed projects, generating $120 million of revenue and over $50 million of profit. In the waste management segment, we've signed agreements for waste supply and hydrogen offtake for our first project. In the industrial factories and recycling segment, we are undertaking a paid feasibility study with a global recycling company and are in talks with Hitachi about using our MIG technology in Japan. In the wastewater treatment segment, we've already secured two paying customers. And in the agriculture and farming segment, we've completed a grant to evaluate making hydrogen from straw residues. The founders of Wildfire have years of experience in the energy and waste industries with leading energy and utility companies. Our experience covers R&D, engineering, project execution, operations and sales. We are currently seeking up to $2 million in exchange for 10% equity in Wildfire Energy. Our pre-money valuation is $20 million and is based on peer comparables, forecast earnings and our IP position. We will use the funds to undertake a world-first demonstration to convert waste into purified hydrogen and drive a fuel cell vehicle. We will also engineer and construct a commercial MIG reactor module. This will be a fully functioning commercial product. And finally, we will engineer and permit our first commercial project, Project Proton, ready for construction and increase our sales and marketing activities globally. For this collection of activities, we've already secured $600,000 of government grants and have a good chance of securing a further $1 million. An investment in wildfire energy delivers solutions to a challenging waste and environmental problems and participation in markets with long-term growth potential. Proprietary technology which is owned 100% by wildfire and which has been reviewed by leading experts. Access to a blue chip globally diverse customer base across a wide range of industry segments. And a low capex high margin technology business with recurring revenues complemented by a selective investment in our own projects. Hello everyone, my name is Alan Hunter and I am the founder of NRN, the National Renewable Network. The National Renewable Network is building a, a connected network of solar and battery storage systems, enabling households and businesses to switch to renewable energy without the upfront cost or finance while also saving money on their energy bill. We use the latest technology and infrastructure to partner with energy retailers. This allows energy retailers to offer cheaper energy plans that includes renewable energy hardware without the barriers we have today. This will result in lower emissions, lower energy pricing, and a greener future for Australia. What are the issues that we are solving? There are three main stakeholders in our supply chain that are suffering from the renewable energy transition. It's investors, retailers, and consumers. Investors are yielding a less than 5% from investing into large solar or wind farms that we're currently building in Australia. Unfortunately, energy retailers are the losers. They do not earn or they in fact, they lose money every time a consumer buys a solar system. And a consumer, look, it costs about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for them to buy a solar and battery system to go fully green, which is over a ten-year payback period. The other issue for a consumer is the management and liability of the of the hardware. One in five solar systems in Australia today are malfunctioning, which is a huge concern that we rely on end users, the consumer, to upgrade our infrastructure and for them to take that liability. The cost of energy pricing, we all know it's been increasing, but that's not the cost of energy, it's the cost of our expensive and outdated supply chain.
As you can see, the retailer only earns 7% of your energy bill today without them going solar. If a consumer does go solar, they don't earn anything at all. Really, where a lot of our money is going is we are investing in the generation of our power stations to be able to, I guess, transmit energy to our homes. There is a better solution today, and Renewable can solve that. So our solution is a three-tiered structure. We are providing an energy management solution for retailers to join our virtual power plant and distributed energy resource solution. This means we can give the tools to retailers to manage their decentralized electricity. We are also asset managers. We own, procure, and manage the renewable energy assets that are distributed upon residential and commercial properties across the country. This enables retailers to then create an innovative innovative energy plan, which will include the hardware, very similar to your mobile phone today. And that's what we're trying to achieve. Our supply chain is very simple. We go from generating the power on site to storing the power on site, to then the retailer selling that energy to the consumer and the energy market. So increasing their, uh, increasing their revenue and increasing their profitability. The retailer is able to disperse their revenue and making sure that they earn enough from the market, providing the end user, the consumer, a cheaper energy bill. We've been able to achieve a 36% cheaper energy bill through our current partners to date and increase their GP by 300% from what they would earn without renewable today. Our product suite is a very large ecosystem. So to start off with, it's about renewable energy management, our virtual power plant, and in the future of tokenized electricity. Our renewable energy assets are either leased or um, on energy models with our retailers. We have funds and SPV set up in our business to be able to fund the hardware um, for NRN. We offer growth services for our retailers and we do capture data every second. And we, we look at a, a large part of our revenue business will be data as a service for in the future. Market is very big in Australia. We've nearly set 9 million homes that have the accessibility to, to have solar on their roofs. Near over 5 million still don't have that. So there is a huge barrier of why people haven't made that transition. And we believe that's a huge uh, solution that NRN is offering. With a lot of people who do have solar, they do not have battery. Again, because of the costing factors and those barriers, this is another market for us that we are able to approach and support. The other side is the competitive um, energy market. The energy market is very competitive. With nearly 300 retailers and 93 of the mainstream retailers, we're able to support the new innovative, innovative companies coming into the market. There's been a lot of adoption in the space with 30,000 installations happening every month across Australia and a 15% year on year adoption. We are going to have an entire in renewable energy infrastructure soon, but someone needs to manage this. And this is where NRN comes to play. Where do we sit in, the, in, in our competitive landscape? We're not a solar retailer. We're not a finance or buy now, pay later. We are a network that will upgrade our infrastructure to manage the renewable energy and making sure that the transition is smooth and viable for everyone. The traction that we've had so far is that we have gone out and we've, we've bootstrapped to date with over 600 solar installations completed in which the profitability has been able to fund the business to where we are today. We've run a pilot of 31 properties that are under management, and we're currently establishing a $9 million debt fund uh, as, a, as a vehicle to be able to fund the next round. The, new, the two retail uh, energy retailers that are coming on board have a huge pipeline for us so we can facilitate over the next 12 to 18 months. Our roadmap over the next 18 months is about really establishing ourselves in, into, into the market and getting a, a bigger pilot up and running. We're looking to install just under 900 properties before June 23 and having just under $10 million under management. This would give us an annualized return of $1.7 million. By that time, we want to have three new energy retailers, have a new fund uh, established or multiple funds within our business. The operation is set up for growth and our virtual power plant cloud beta is in market and launched. The unit economics of this model and our growth strategy. Our growth strategy is about working with our energy retailers to upgrade their current consumers to our network. It's not about spending money acquiring new customers. Because of the increase of profitability and the decrease in churn, this is a huge value for our retailers. Over the next five years, we're aiming to support 43,000 homes in Australia, adopt to our energy, our national renewable network, and save money. This is going to cost 
anything between four to five hundred million dollars over the next five years, but will return us just under a hundred million dollars of annual recurring revenue for the few decades to come. Asset funding strategy is very clear and also it's, it's also separated outside of the, of the operating business. We, are, we envision that we set up multiple SPVs for different types of investors and different structures that will enable us to roll out the debt funds over the next five years. Currently, we have the first one that's open at $9 million, which has a fund manager and it will go straight into the SPV. So our operating company will then pay back those returns. Unit economics of this makes it very attractive for us and our investors. With a 22% rate of return for our product, we're able to offer very attractive rates for our investors and have a very good cash flow model through the journey. With a payback period of, of only 52 months, uh, we, we have a long journey of between 10 to 20 years of, of, of that revenue. And that all depends on the lifetime of the hardware. So let me talk to you about this current raise. Look, we're currently raising $2.5 million at a pre-money valuation of eight and a half mil. This is 30% equity in our business to help us take the business to the next step. The money will be mainly spent on building the foundation. So there's legals, there's salaries, there's um, operational expenses to make sure that we can support the retailers ne uh, next steps in, the, uh, in growing with our network. There is a growth in marketing expense and also the tech side to develop our virtual power plant framework. This investment will help us with a runway of 18 months and get us to that stage of a $1.7 million occurring revenue. A case study, it's very clear just to, to show, this is our consumer decreased energy bill of 36% based on the default market offering and a retailer increasing their profitability by 300%. This is a win-win scenario for everyone. And that's why we're really excited about what we're doing at NRN. I'd like to thank you all for your time today. It's been awesome having the opportunity to talk to you about our business. If you want to have a chat with me, I'd love to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You can go through these numbers in further detail. But um, uh, hopefully, uh, if, you, yeah, if you want any questions or anything I can do to help, please reach out to me and I'll speak to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for day one of Venture and Capital. I'm sure you've enjoyed it. Now, as I mentioned, there's two parts to this. This morning was around the presentation part. This second part is really about you and engaging with the speakers that have participated and also the companies that have presented as well. So the way we've done that is we've actually got a live Q&A breakout session where you get the opportunity to get face-to-face -face with VCs. Also, there's a very special session for WI Capital. I'm gonna be doing a breakdown as far as what we're looking at, how we're looking at things, uh, the opportunities we're seeing, and some of, and basically, uh, I suppose, the platform that we're creating for investors to engage with uh, some, some of the opportunities that come through WI Capital. So, that's what's gonna be taking place now. This is all about you engaging with, as I said, the companies and also the speakers that presented today. I said, so enjoy the breakout sessions. All the notifications for when sessions are taking place are inside Brella. Um, so look for the breakout room tab in the actual uh, session and also look for the notifications as well as that will steer you where to go. So glad you enjoyed day one. Stay tuned, enjoy the breakout sessions, enjoy hopefully the session with me. And then obviously tomorrow we are back for day two of Venture and Capital.